Okay, so let's start. Good morning. Can you hear me well? So just testing also the sound because we uh, already start to broadcast. Okay, so if you use the Dataverse 2023 hashtag, so it's already my colleagues already tweeted about that. So try to disseminate it. I know that in some parts, some parts of the world, people are sleeping. Some Dataverse <laughs> users are sleeping now, <laughs> so maybe they they will not follow us. But um, so at least we are recording, and uh, so all the sessions here uh, from today and tomorrow will be live stream and also recorded, and uh, and later we will put it available. So it's a pleasure to 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 have this opening session. We already start the work yesterday uh, with uh, with um, great workshops, uh, quite well attended. I, I was a bit surprised because almost everyone, 95% of the participants arrived yesterday. I thought that some people skipped the, the workshops. Um, these are the, so it's it's great. We have, um, with the, the, the arrival of Merce, now we are 104, okay? <laughs> yesterday we were 103. And we have, uh, so this, the images are not updated here. If you count, you have 103 participants from 23 different countries, is great. Of course, we have Portugal on, on, on the top of the list, but we have also Spain and uh, Germany and the States with, uh, with an important presence. But it's great that we have different continents, so, and so 23 countries, 104 participants. We are only waiting for one more that was registered and didn't arrive. I don't know who is, but <laughs> okay. So with this uh, information, it was just to to uh, to do a kind of ice break. So I give the floor uh, to um, Eugenio Ferreira, that that is the, the the vice director for research and innovation from our university, University of Minho. Minho is not easy to say. I understand, but if you try Minho, it's you will do it. Okay. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the Univers Universidade do Minho. Um, let me uh, start by, uh, by, by salute uh, all the members of this opening session. Philippe Conze, the chair of the Global Dataverse Community Steering Committee. Stefano Iacos, director of data science and product research at the Institute of, for Quantitative Social Science from Harvard University and Jean Nuno Ferreira, the general coordinator of FCCN, the scientific competing unit of the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology. I would like to extend my recognition and by acknowledging and congratulating the organizing committee of this meeting, especially the local organizers from the documentation and library service unit headed by Pedro Príncipe, for the, for the University of Minho, it is uh, gratifying to see that the, the bet we have made uh, uh, more than 20 years ago on open access and open science has proved to be uh, correct, having contributed significantly to the development of uh, our scientific communities and the scientific system itself. The University of Minho has was one of the world's pioneer institutions in open access by establishing its institutional repository, the Repositorium, in November 2003, and by defining its first policy for self-archiving of scientific production, which came into force in January from of, uh, 20, of uh, 2005. With regard to research data, Data Repositorium, powered by Dataverse project. In, in fact, the, this is the first, uh, the first one implementation of Dataverse in Portugal, was later created to share, publish, and manage research data. At this stage, we are currently updating our open science policy with uh, a dedicated chapter on management and opening of research data. We are establishing requirements and recommendations for the management and openness of data to ensure that research data are collected, documented, and stored by uh, university researchers in accordance with strict quality standards throughout the data lifecycle, guaranteeing rigor and integrity 
in all aspects of our research. This year, the Dataverse community meeting deals with the relevance and sustainability of services for connecting shared data and infrastructures like data repositories networks for disaster re risk re reduction. Discussion, discussion on the quality of uh, data and discoverability and accessibility will be on top of the table. The conference welcomes several workshops, lightning talks, discussion panels, demos, posters, and one keynote, being an opportunity for Dataverse community members and project teams to share original developments and implementations and best practices. I also have noticed social cultural moments, a welcome reception held yesterday at the Rector Act, a social dinner, sports and wellness moment, uh, besides coffee networking. I wish you all a very fruitful conference and for those of you coming from abroad, a very pleasant stay in Braga. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for welcoming us. So for, my name is Philip Concert. I'm the chair of the Global Dataverse Community Consortium. Uh, so some of you met me yesterday at the GDCC session. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to, to be here in uh, Minyo, um, the University of Minyo, um, the first, at the first uh, Dataverse community meeting outside of Harvard. Um, we had a great day yesterday with workshops and uh, also the, the welcoming, the reception in, in the center of Minyo. Um, so as far as I know, um, this is one of the first community meeting or the first, first large, larger face-to-face -face meeting, international face-to-face -face meeting in the data risk community since 2020 when we gathered at my university, the, the Arctic University of Norway. So it's very good to be able to, and to meet face-to-face -face in the community. Um, yeah, and I'm very happy now to see that the community has returned to Europe uh, and that Pedro and his team of the University of Minho has made it possible to, to meet here again. Um, and as, you, as we saw yesterday already in some of the presentations, Dataverse has been incredibly popular around the world. Uh, so we just saw or heard yesterday that some days ago, uh, on our map of officially announced Dataverse installations, uh, we have now reached 100, 100 installations. So um, this is very great to, to, to see, this, this increasing popularity. Um, and maybe not surprisingly, the, most of the installations, they are in uh, the Americas and in Europe. So of these 100 installations, uh, 42 are in the Americans, North and South America, and 41 are in, in Europe. So somehow it's not kind of um, um, a surprise that the first meeting out of, outside of Harvard is, is hosted in, in, in Europe. Um, yeah, so as, as was just men mentioned now, the, 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 um, the theme of this uh, community meeting is summarized in three keywords, is sustainability, trust, and community building. Uh, and this increasing popularity and spread of Dataverse across the globe also brings with it some challenges. So I think it's very important that we address these um, issues, and not only from the technical side, as I mentioned also yesterday, but also uh, community aspects. Uh, so we need to address the different uh, needs and, and um, uh, in the community from, from different installation types and also different uh, thematic uh, types. So it's, it's very good that this will be discussed at this community meeting. We started yesterday already and we will hear a lot of um, uh, new um, discussions today about ad addressing these issues in, in, in the, the keynote and um, presentations, uh, um, demos and so on. And I'm looking forward to fruitful and interesting discussions uh, today and tomorrow. And uh, to conclude, I would just, um, on behalf of the Global Data Risk Community Consortium, I would like to thank uh, Pedro and his team for making this possible, this meeting, and also the Uni University of Minho to, to host um, the, the ninth Data Risk Community Meeting. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. I'm Stefano Iacus. I said I'm the new managing director of Data Earth. I succeeded uh, Merce, which is here today. Um, and I, I start <laughs> by thanking the University of Minho for hosting this, um, this conference, and especially Pedro for all the work and his team, of course, and the organizing committee. Uh, we have a wonderful program. I mean, it's an amazing program with many talks, workshops, and, and so forth. And we also have a keynote, which is Merce, uh, which, which has a, um, a very large legacy in terms of what uh, today is Dataverse. So we are very thankful to her. So when I start a few months ago, let's say last summer, I, I immediately felt the vibrant energy of this community. It's, it was, at that time, I think, uh, less than 90 installations, or even less, yes. And now we have 100 installations, and, and I know uh, new are coming from, from Asia. So we will have one in South Korea coming up, another one in Japan, and so forth. So it's really an increasing, it's increasing growing community. The other thing I met immediately is my team. So the Dataverse team, half of, um, I would say 75% of this team is here today. So we have Phil, Gustavo, Ellen, Steven, and then there is also Julian. So please take the opportunity to talk to them because this is um, the best time to, to meet together and put your question directly to them. So it's an incredible team. They do an immense work that is only partly visible to the community in terms of making Dataverse a sustainable open source project. This month has also been the opportunity to revise a bit the way we develop um, the, the project because of its complexity. It has a long legacy, 100 installation, meaning lots of stakeholders out there, uh, which needs um, improvements, uh, as for features, and, and so forth. We expanded the core team uh, to Jim, Oliver, and Don. Um, so these are members of the community coming into the core team of, of Dataverse, meaning that now the community has a voice in taking decision about the roadmap of Dataverse, which is very important. So it's not just us taking a decision, but it's really something between us and you. And it's also been the opportunity to rethink a bit of the architecture of Dataverse to make it more interoperable, modular, and so forth. I will talk about this later. Uh, we have a joint talk with Gustavo in a few minutes, um, but, that, but this is an important step toward the sustainability of Dataverse in the long, in the long run. And then, um, as of yesterday, we released the new roadmap. So what's, what we think uh, Dataverse should be in the next few years, let's say, or few months, uh, to be more realistic. And, um, and a series of technical documents have been released along with the roadmap uh, today, so uh, please take the time to read the roadmap. Um, and that's it, so thank you again for having us here. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ronan Ferreira, and I'm the general coordinator of the FCCN unit inside the National Funding Agency, FCT. In our unit, uh, we focus more uh, on providing and developing uh, digital services for uh, not only the universities, higher education, but also for the scientific system in Portugal. We've been working with the Dataverse for a couple of years, uh, and I just like to, to, to stress that we just initiated a pilot phase for our uh, first Dataverse uh, installation called Pollen. And uh, the, the response from the community was very, very good. Uh, we got more uh, applications to work with us in the pilot than those that we could uh, take in. So we had to do some selection and that, that was good. Uh, so now we, we will work in, for the next year with these early adopters uh, to, to fine tune, fine -tune the, the, the usage of this uh, repository. I should say that for now this repository is mainly focused to be as a last resort repository of data, research data, 
for those uh, data that are, are products of FCT uh, uh, grants and FCT uh, research uh, support or research uh, instruments. But as I said, we are quite excited to, to start now using uh, Dataverse in this, in this palette. Um, and I'm even more hopeful because this year we submitted uh, a quite ambitious proposal for have the resources to do a uh, jump ahead in terms of building uh, a national uh, network of uh, repositories for research data. It's, it is still being uh, evaluated. Uh, we, are, we are proposing to use uh, funding from uh, European Union. So I think that right now it's, it's being evaluated in Brussels. But uh, if everything goes okay, I think before the end of this year, we will have resources to, to do uh, a, a big leap forward in terms of uh, using or intensifying the use of data repositories for research data uh, in Portugal. And so we are quite, uh, quite uh, hopeful that this will, be a, uh, this will happen and uh, we, we will have this, this, these resources to work with the community in the next two years for, for setting up this, this, this larger uh, infrastructure for research data. At the same time, we are developing very fast uh, advanced computing, uh, advanced computing uh, facilities and resources in Portugal, also in coordination with the European Union, and this will play uh, also a, a role in, in terms of synergies, of sharing infrastructures, uh, between the, the computing uh, community and, and the data repository uh, and curation um, community. And so I, I think that Dataverse will play a central role in, this, in, this, in these plans. And um, so for us, it's, 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 it's a pleasure to be associated with this event of the Dataverse community um, that, that, comes, that came to Portugal this year. So it's, it's, it's really a good opportunity. And I, we, I think that we are in Portugal uh, on, on um, a very important time for, for increasing and uh, getting the community around this, this new reality of, of doing better science, open science, regarding the, the research data. Thank you. Thank you very much, all. So thank you, João. Thank you all for the support. Uh, it was not, not only a, a financial support from FCT. It was it was more than that. And uh, thank you, Professor Eugenio, for for the presence and all for all the support for this event. Uh, we are done with the opening. Uh, now I invite um, uh, Stefano and uh, Gustavo to join me. It will not be a, a final of a, a World Soccer Championship between Argentina and Italy. But they will join, one, an Argentinian and an Italian will join me for the, the updates. So the, um, usually we have this uh, presentation on the, on the product updates, new future, future plans. Or we already started discussing this yesterday in one of the workshops, but now it's time. Uh, and we can also ask questions after. So we will stay for this uh, second part of the, this opening. Okay, thank you. Nós, nós podemos ligar outro... Sim. Hello, everyone. I'm Gustavo Durand. For those of you who don't know me yet, I'm the technical lead and architect of Dataverse Project at IQSS at Harvard. Um, and so I know many of you here already know a lot about Dataverse and are, have been part of the community for many years. But for those who are new, we'll start with a quick introduction. And hopefully, um, there'll be some tidbits that are new and are interesting. Uh, but we'll get us all on the same page uh, to start off the community meeting this year. 
So Dataverse is an open source platform. It's for publishing, citing, and archiving research data. We have built it to support multiple different workflows, users, data, so it's very flexible. Um, and we've been working on it since 2006 at Harvard. Um, the funding is provided both from Harvard and IQSS, as well as working in grants and in collaborations with different institutions, with different members of the community to increase the functionality and improve documentation and things like that. Uh, the core team is, we have a core team at IQSS, and this is the first year where I, I can also add, besides just the team at IQSS, we've added key contributors from the community. As Stefano mentioned, this allows the community to have a greater voice in determining the roadmap, working on prioritization uh, for the project. So, in earlier years of the community, we would go over and there'd be a list of all the features. As the project has continued to grow, and it's a little bit too large to just list them all here, but this link here could, is a page that we have on our, on our website, which lists a bunch of the different features. The main thing that I think is always good to describe about Dataverse is that the core code, what we do is we want to make sure we focus on the main principles of publishing data, so sharing, citing, versioning, and making sure to support the fair uh, data principles. At the same time, we've built robust APIs, which allow the interoperability with other systems, other tools, and allow that greater flexibility. Um, many years ago, Gary King, the professor at IQSS, basically described Dataverse as the plumbing behind the scenes. And you know, it's not super pretty always, but it's very important, very critical for a vibrant infrastructure. And I like to add in that the APIs then allow, or the pipes that allow the external tools, the visualizations, or the, you know, the jacuzzi bathroom that you have in your principal bed, bed bathroom to support, you know, it's important, it's nice, it's beautiful, but without those pipes, without that API and that connection to the plumbing, you know, that's very critical to, to make the whole system work. So while we won't go into the features in detail, there are a few critical aspects of the, of the system, which I think are what make Dataverse unique across repository so software in the world. Um, one of them is the concept of Dataverse collections that we have, which basically, Besides just uploading your data sets, it allows you to organize your research in the way that your organization works. So if you're an individual researcher, you might have one Dataverse collection. If you're a journal, you'll have your primary Dataverse collection, and then within that, you can have sub-collections for each issue of your journal, for example. If you're a consortium, you might have a top-level Dataverse collection for the entire consortium, and then individual collections for each university. And then within that, maybe individual ones for departments or researchers. But the nice thing is that the Dataverse collection model allows you to organize it and create the hierarchical structure that is needed by your institution, your organization. Um, and you can apply different sets of rules to different collections. And so, for example, in that one of those models, one Dataverse collection might be for social science data, and so you use social science metadata. Another one might be for astrophysics, and you have astrophysics metadata as the supporting metadata. You can also set up different permissions. And so, in fact, in the next few slides, I talk a little bit the next major, I think, uh, differentiator of Dataverse is the way we handle metadata. Rather than structure it formally in the code, we dynamically load it into the database and define the database. So in that way, your institution, your installation can have the metadata that you need, again, whether it's social science, astrophysics, geospatial, journal. The kinds of metadata that we support keeps growing because we keep working amongst ourselves and within the community to find and establish new metadata um, what we call metadata blocks to support different standards, different domains, basically anything. Um, you can also create custom metadata blocks for individual groups within your installation. Within Harvard Dataverse, for example, there are many different custom blocks that are specified for how that organization wants to define their metadata and the kinds of things that they are trying to define for their data sets. Um, and the way the metadata is de defined, it's again, very dynamic, and it supports you know, single values, multiple values, compound, controlled vocabularies. It's all defined in a file that you upload and into your, into your installation as needed. The second one that I mentioned when I was talking about Dataverse collections that you can define differently is the permissions. So that's another thing where different installations, different institutions all have different workflows that they need to support. An individual researcher, for example, wants to keep strict control of their Dataverse collection and only allow themselves or their coworkers to upload data, but allow themselves to publish it and have basically full access and full rights to everything. Whereas a journal might do something different where anybody can deposit a data, but no one can publish it unless it's been curated by, by their curators. And so our permission system that we have at Dataverse, that again, you can define differently per Dataverse collection, allows you to have that flexibility of the workflows. Um, 
And you can also set up different groups. So in the permissions that you allow, you could have the permissions be for an individual. It can be for a static group of, say, defining these three individuals. Or we also have ways of defining groups based on your login type. So for example, with if you're we use Shibboleth as one way to log in. And so for example, when I log into Harvard Dataverse, I use my Harvard key to log in. And there's a group for anyone who logs in with a Harvard key, and so is identified as a Harvard user, can have is part of that group. So you can define access for people who are members of your installation based on how they logged in. Um, and then the last, I think, key differentiator is that we've had a major focus on the, on the APIs and making them robust. This is something we've worked on really strongly and has been a, a critical need since Dataverse 4 came out maybe, I don't even know now, like five to eight years ago. Um, and is actually part of what's allowing us to work on this re-architecture project that Stefan is going to talk about. The fact that we already have APIs for much of what's possible through the UI is going to make the re-architecture project more smooth because, as we'll learn, the idea is to make the Dataverse core be focused on the API and have the front end be a separate application. Um, but we'll learn more about that in a minute. Um, we also have a very good extensive API guide to use the, to um, follow the APIs and you know, learn of how to use them and connect to them. Okay, so the technology that we have in Dataverse, I always talk about this as, the, as a tech lead architect, I always want to make sure people are aware. It's a Java web application. We're running on a product called Pyara. We're using currently the version 5, but it, there's an asterisk next to it because one of the things that we're, as on our upcoming roadmap, is to upgrade to the latest version of Pyara, which is Pyara 6. We'll I'll talk about that again in, in the future plans a little bit. Um, but we use Java Enterprise Edition for basically, right now, for all levels, presentation, business, and storage. The presentation, again, that's going to be changing when we talk about the, the re-architecture, um, but it will still rely on the RESTful APIs that we use. And then we, for storage, we use you know, Postgres for keeping administrative information and information about these def definitions of metadata and the roles that are discussed. Um, we use Solar for indexing, and then the actual files, the actual data can be stored locally or it can be stored on Swift or S3. For example, at Harvard, we run ours on AWS and use S3 for our storage. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about you guys, about the community, and how we interact with you. So. In the community, the first thing I always look at is how many people have actively participated into the GitHub repository. And so we currently have over 165 people who have made some contribution into the Dataverse repository. This is often code, but it's not just code. It can also be like code for functionality, but also code for tests. Some of it is documentation, things like that. But the community, as you know, and as many of you here are, is much more vibrant than just the people who are actively working on the project. It's all the members of the community, the researchers, the librarians, the data scientists, the users of Dataverse. Um, and we work within, with the community to provide lots of useful um, help. We do workshops and trainings regularly. We have done UI UX testing and interviewing to, you know, as we work on the UI. There's the Global Dataverse Community Consortium. Um, there was a session yesterday. There will be a session, I think, tomorrow about it. Um, so you can learn a lot more. I'll talk about it very briefly in the next slide. Um, we communicate with the community in many different ways. There's a Google group that's a mailing list that everyone interacts with. Um, but then we also have chat way, ways of chatting more directly in either Matrix or there's a community Slack. Um, one thing that I always like to point out about the Google groups that has shown the vibrancy of the community is that when we first started it, you know, an email would come in and especially with the global nature of the community, it would come in, you know, in the middle of the night and it wouldn't get answered necessarily until, you know, the morning when Phil got logged in and would be like, oh, let me, let me respond. But now as the community grows, the community is beating us to the answer. Something is sent out and by the time, like, we wake up and look, there's already, you know, two, three responses in the thread and a vibrant discussion about whatever the topic was that someone asked. So it's a very great way of communicating and it's very, I don't know, it's very nice to see the robustness and the vibrancy. Um, we also do community calls. We do them bi-weekly. Uh, we do actually two calls. We do one for the Americas part time, time frame and, and Europe, like it's, you know, American morning, European afternoon. And then there's a second one that we do that's more for the Asian Australian part of the world since we don't want them to have to wake up in the middle of the night for the, the community call. And then of course we have the annual community meeting, this meeting, and welcome everybody. It's great to see everybody. Um, the other thing I think that makes the community special and that makes this community special that I have not seen at least in another conference is that we have the Dataverse Cup. So this afternoon, everyone's invited and welcome to join us and play. That's me last year hosting the Dataverse Cup up, of course. <laughs> Um, and as I've learned from Pedro, 
Taça de Dataverse in, in Portuguese. So the first and I think it's probably the third or fourth annual Dataverse Cup and the first annual Taça de Dataverse. <laughs> Messy. <laughs> we'll just leave this slide for <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, so back to the Global Dataverse Community Consortium. So this was something created many years ago. Um, <clears throat> it started with conversation with Mer Marseille and with John Crabtree. And the idea was how can we get the different um, repositories working together, different installations working together. So this organization is this basically to support you guys. Um, one of the main things that it, one of the first things it did was pr become a DOI provider, data site provider. So it would make it more inexpensive to mint DOIs at, rather than have everyone have to be their own individual provider. Um, but since then it's grown, a lot of it is now just getting, working on functionality together. For example, Jim Myers is hired out as a contractor for the GDCC and when an installation has some extra funding and can hire, say, a quarter developer, half a developer, they talk to the GDCC and another installation comes in and takes the other half and together, they work together, Jim sits at his computer, you know, probably into the hours of the night, works it and the next day, boom, new functionality for Dataverse. Um, so the GDCC helps coordinate all that and other things of supporting the Dataverse community. And for more detail, again, there's a session tomorrow with John and Philip and others of the community. So I was hoping to be the first one to be able to say, we're at 100, but it, that was stolen by Philip and by Stefano, they mentioned it. But yes, we are now 100 installations around the world. We say self-reporting because being open source, we are more than 100. It's just 100 is what we know. People have told us that they want to be added on the map. Um, I personally also am excited in this past year, we've added Argentina for the Universidad de Rosario, so we're on the map as well. Um, and yeah, as I think Philip also said, these are the installations, but within these installations, there are you know, tens, dozens, hundreds of other universities that are also using these 100 existing dataverses. So we can see it is very global. It's used all over, all over the US, all over the world. You know, every continent, I think, except Antarctica is represented. We need an Antarctic uh, Dataverse installation soon, I hope. And so here we can see a little bit about the data. Um, I think when I take this slide, I basically take the previous year's slide, and I think Stefano mentioned, I think last year, I think we were at 83 maybe. So between last year and this year, we've grown. We're now at 100. Um, those 100 Dataverses, we take the metrics from about, from 76 of those installations, basically anything that's running 4.9 or newer has APIs for metrics that we can gather and um, and aggregate. And so within those 76 installations, there are over 15,000 Dataverse collections. They consist of over 350,000 data sets. There are almost 5 million files and they've been downloaded, you know, seven, almost 75 million times. So you can see, you know, Dataverse is used all over. Here we see a little bit by the subjects. I think once upon a time, social science was the biggest block since, you know, we started with IQSS, but over time, medicine, health and life sciences and arts and humanities are growing and increasing those domains in, in the community. Okay, so next I will talk a little bit about new features since last year's community meeting. Um, one of the main things that we worked on during this time was the project called the Harvard Data Commons. And this was really a project that was meant to help automate flows of research data from research computing environments to management, publications, discovery, preservation environments. So there were three primary objectives and you know, the, the idea was to automate the technical pipeline between the research and com computing and the Dataverse. At the same time, we wanted to enhance Dataverse support um, to support machine actionable workflows of various types. And we wanted to also automate beyond just the first uh, connection, connections with reacher systems and the key library systems for archiving and publishing. Um, I think one of the people from University of Minho talked about they're doing something similar here with notification and, and with core, which we'll see in a, in a, in a minute. Um, so a few of the functionality that was done to enable these these objectives. One is Globus integration. We've worked a lot with Jim, GDCC, and Borealis to be able to add files via Globus. Um, and more importantly, part of that process isn't just adding files, but also this idea of the file may actually not be moved into Dataverse, but Dataverse will learn about the file, have the metadata, but the, the file itself might stay at its original source. And this is something that will be very critical for helping support more and more sensitive data where you can't necessarily move the data or large data where it's again, challenging to move it, but the discoverability on Dataverse is the, is the critical feature there. Um, it is one of these external tools that talks to Dataverse via the API, and we are working on integrating it as part of the upload workflow uh, for Dataverse. The second functionality is this idea of the support for computational workflows. 
Um, so we already had external tools that supported these kind of workflows, but to better support it, we added some metadata. There's a new metadata block called a computational workflow block. Again, this goes with the metadata block. It was de defined in a tab separated values file and was just able to be uploaded into the software without having to you know, rebuild the, the core part of the code. Um, we also made some changes into the faceting to be able to discover and basically rise up the priority of finding these kinds of things. So we have this new data set feature facet, which you can see here in this image, so that you can basically define a metadata block so you find all data sets that use that metadata block. So you can you know, help discover the computational workflows. But we did it in a generic way as well, so it could be used for anything. If your data first installation really cares about geospatial data and you want those to be more discoverable, you could have that block be the, a, a feature that is shown there. Um, and with that, we also got uh, automatic checksum validation on Bagot files uploads, because that was very important for this computational workflows to be able to make sure that Bagot is supported and, and is, you know, the checksum validates. And then the last feature I think that was a big part of this, this collaboration, this project, was this idea to improve the connections between systems. So we improved, and we already had some archiving, but we added some new features. We, it includes now a new API for getting the archive status and a display for the admin. And we've been working on this idea of bi-directional notifications of related resources. Um, it will eventually be compliant with the core notification protocol, but the idea is that different systems can notify each other when someone uploads a publication that has data in Dataverse, or, then or, there's a notification sent over and the connection is made, the related publication is added, and the connection between the system that hosts the data is linked to the system that hosts the, the publication. And in addition, in doing this, a bonus feature that we got for free basically that was important for this but it can be used more generally is the ability to add custom instructions when you're using data set templates um, for users. Outside of that, you know, we talked about the APIs and the external tools. So some recent tools that have been added in the past year that are very exciting is we now have a map pre previewer tool. Um, so if you have a GeoJSON file and you upload that, then you can see a preview of the map. It looks something like that on your data set page. And secondly, we have a zip file previewer, which allows you to see the, um, the contents of a zip file. Now you notice there's a plus there because it's actually more than just a previewer. It uses some range functionality. And so besides just being able to view the contents of the zip file, it will allow you to download individual files from within the zip file without having to download the entire, the entire package. And both of these were basically worked on by the community. So that's what's really, really nice again about the community. In the past, I think in other years, the features that I introduced are ones that you know, the core team worked on. And now it's a mix, some core, some com community. But there's so much value added from, from the community as much as our core team. OK, so what do we do at Harvard? What are we working on now? What's our future plans? So our team at Harvard, we, we have a lot of different roles to play. So one is, of course, we support Harvard Dataverse. Anything, when Sonia comes up with an issue or new functionality that she needs, she comes to us and we try to prioritize that. that and enters, that's one of the key entrances into our prioritization queue. The second is we facilitate the development of the community so we can get these cool features like the map previewer. Um, in addition, you know, we talked about how our funding comes from some grants and projects like that. And so one of the ones we're working on is this project with the National Institute of Health of the US, of USA. And it's called GREI, G-R-E-I, which is a Generalist Repository Ecosystem Initiative. And so for that, we both have an individual proposal of things that we are working on, and also this idea of a co-opetition, a combination co competition and cooperation with the other repositories that are part of this great project. And then, of course, there's always other Dataverse-related projects that we're working on um, that are very interesting that take some of our time. So the great project, we won't go into detail on each of these, but what is nice to see is all these things are things that we were interested in working on anyway. I mean, supporting large data, supporting sensitive data, um, increasing the the workflows, the software and biomedical workflows, that's you know, working with the metadata, things like that. Um, evaluation of ev evolution of the architecture, that's what Stefano's gonna talk about in a minute and we'll see what we're doing with that. So this was a very good partnership to work with because it basically provided funding for things that we were interested in working on and uh, would be working on anyway and now we have the support for that and able to work with within our team and the community to, to make these things happen. So our upcoming releases, um, we are 
last released 5.13 several months ago. Um, and the idea is we want to, as I mentioned in the technology slide, we want to upgrade our infrastructure to use PyRS 6. We want to get to the latest and greatest of that. Um, so we're going to make one last release of Dataverse 5, Dataverse 5.14. It's, you know, consists of the usual new features and bug fixes, contributions to the community. You know, I'm sure some of it will be in one of the new feature slides for next year's community meeting. Um, and at the same time, when we do that, we're going to freeze that. And then we've already been working on the 6.0 upgrade, but it's been in a separate branch. So we will then merge that, and we will now our development branch will all be a PyR 6 thing. And soon after 5.14, we hope to release Dataverse 6, which functionality-wise, we probably won't add any new functionality. But we, again, we are going to upgrade the infrastructure and have that support um, so then we can move beyond that. And then beyond 6, we're going to be doing the re-architecture project. Um, I, you can see here it's about separating the front end and back end, but the details are all going to come in a minute from Stefano. And we mentioned the roadmap. So you can go to this. This is the link to the roadmap. And that's where you can see what we're working on, what we're planning on, our goals. That's where there's a link to these documents that we're publishing that all have to do with re-architecture. And so with that, I welcome you to the community meeting and pass it on to Stefano. Thank you very much, Gustavo. So you have seen this was just the last year. It's an incredible amount of work. And during this last year, I came up with this idea, which is actually a long-standing idea. And I say, why don't we also re-architecture database? On top of all of this, and all the grants we have to do, and all the, <laughs> the stakeholders we have, why don't we also do this thing? So let me go through this. Um, let me start with the goals. So why we're doing this? Uh, we already had a workshop yesterday introducing all much of the details around this idea of re-architecturing uh, Dataverse. But, but the, the audience is, is a bit different from what we had yesterday. So the first, of course, important point is let's modernize um, the application. So modernize in terms of using new technology or being able to adopt new technologies in the way we develop uh, Dataverse. Then as Gustavo mentioned, the, the main idea is to separate the backend and front end with the scope of increasing even more the interoperability between Dataverse and other, uh, say, platforms which exist in any library systems. So even at Harvard, we have, of course, like here at Universal Minio, there are several workflows. And data is just one, maybe the central, in some cases, central pieces of these workflows, but it's an important piece. With this, we also uh, get the capability to extend even more the modularization of Dataverse. And you will see what it means in a minute. We can also speed up the development and implementation of new UI or UX features. Um, because the way now um, Dataverse application is built, it requires every time you, you change the front end, you have to also to, to work on the back end. And this is kind of sl uh, slowing a bit the, the process of implementing new ideas. With this, we will get, uh, with this re-architecture project, we will, uh, we will get also the native support for accessibility standards and internationalization. So, and there are also projects which will be discussed uh, at this conference about uh, supporting different types of, um, say, UI interactions and, uh, uh, with Dataverse. And in the end, the, the scope is, of course, that of empowering the community. In which sense? Of course, modularity allows you to, to be more creative around Dataverse as a community member. But the idea is that with, with the idea of plug and play of this new model, uh, the community do not need to, to wait for us to approve their code and merge into the base codes. So these new models can be just produced independently by the community, put in a, in a kind of a marketplace. So this model is, is available to everyone, and everyone can use it. And so you are totally empowered of and also responsible for maintaining uh, this piece of code. So Dataverse is like this now, is a monolithic. Uh, application. I like the, this image. Um, so besides the technical uh, details that, that I try to, to throw here in, um, in this picture, the point is everything is one application. So the, the front end, the back end, some of the models are also part of 
strictly integrated with the um, DB Core in terms of how much code you have to share between the Dataverse code base and the, and the models. There, are, there is already this idea of modularity through external modules which communicate to Dataverse back and forth through API, and we have seen the Globus examples and others. And we still have the, the, the opportunity uh, to, to connect Dataverse to external, uh, say, physical storage repositories through the S3 or other protocols and uh, Globus, which is again another example of how you can store especially big data or sensitive data outside data itself, but still have the, the, the metadata information in, into Dataverse. So this kind of flexibility is already there. And there is also, uh, for those who attended yesterday the workshop, the idea of um, making, as Gustavo said, the, um, the metadata more flexible. So you can add your personal metadata block. You can uh, now even uh, control the way you input um, metadata information to external vocabularies. So there is a framework based on JavaScript that you can plug into the present UI. Um, that allows you to be more flexible and increase the number of metadata standards that we, we can support. But we want to go one step further. So we want to separate the backend and the front end, um, make it the backend even more robust and interoperable, so that this, uh, these new Dataverse modules are, as I said, can be contributed independently by the community, so they are totally responsible. And we decided to go for React in terms of, of the new front end. So the front end is a single page application, it's a separate application with a separate, um, say, development um, cycles. Um, so we don't need to update the, the back end every time we want to implement new feature on, on, the, on, the, on the SPA and vice versa. So we are more flexible. And also the idea is that we are preparing a set of of design elements, so components of, for, the, for the user interface, which the modules can also use. So now if you use the Globus uh, endpoint, or if you use the DP creator for differential privacy, what, what happens in Dataverse is that you go to another website, essentially. Or you go outside Dataverse, you have a different user interface, so you have a u u different experience, and in this way, uh, this is the opportunity to, to have an integrated user experience, even if the modules are completely external and uh, independent from Dataverse. In terms of interoperability, having, so focusing on the backend uh, extension of the API, I mean, 80 maybe 90% of the API uh, can give you access to, to most of the functionalities in, uh, in Dataverse. So we just need to complete the last uh, miles, let's say and make it pro possibly more, uh, more robust and more flexible in terms of new needs for, for the front ends. But in general, the idea is that you can control what Dataverse when this is done completely through Python or any other, uh, say, in interface, so even from your own uh, uh, internal tools at the library, to manage uh, workflows between Dataverse and, uh, and your system. So that's the idea. So that's a nicer picture of what we are taking from yesterday workshop uh, from Guillermo's slides. The idea is that we are designing pieces so of code uh, so that you can reuse this and create your own uh, new, say, application around Dataverse or the new plugin or new UI. And so we have a design system element. This JS Dataverse will be the interface between the current API and the rest of the world, let's say, uh, the application uh, and, and so forth, and plugin. And yesterday, it came up this idea of why don't we create even a Dataverse plugin marketplace? So a place where everyone in the community can submit their own tools, like for many other applications, think, think about browsers, for example, and everyone can pick what they need for their specific needs, so they can, they can propose new stuff. So you have seen this hexagon there, uh, I will talk about this in a, in a minute. So, Gustavo has already mentioned that we will release 5.14, and then we will go from, from Payara 6 to Payara, sorry, 5 to 6, and this will be essentially uh, independent of what we're doing for the re-architecture. 
but this will be also the base for the new architecture to, to be uh, developed. The transition between five and six will be, or within uh, the old and the new backend, will be kind of easy. So we're trying to make it as easy as, as possible. And we will support any installation that want to do the migration. And we will support both systems for a period of time. But at some point, we will declare the, the old system like um, frozen. And so we will focus on, on the new one. Uh, but don't be afraid, we are there to help you, and GDCC will be there to help you with this transition. So, we have presented yesterday uh, the first uh, release of the SPA. So just, it's a proof of concept of what we are doing, um, how these backend and frontend are now being separated. We have presented also the, the technical side of it, so the development system, and different tools that we are using and make it available to the community. Um, and uh, today we released the, this roadmap, as Gustavo mentioned already. So you can look at the, at the documents. Um, so you will see this is the main document. It's just two pages. From these two pages, you, you will see all the structure of what we are going to do. This will be our roadmap. And within this document, there are links to all the other technical documents. And within those documents, there are even more technical documents. So depending on your, <laughs> uh, your level of understanding or curiosity, you can go very deep into what we are doing. So everything is now uh, released. So to come to this two page, it took like, I would say, seven months. So we start in August. We, we prepare our own view of what the Dataverse should be in the next years. Then we send out to the community. We gather all the comments from mo most members of the community. We get back to Harvard. Uh, we did internal discussion uh, with different stakeholders we have also inside Harvard. And finally, we came up with this. So it, it has been a long process. So it's very thoughtful. So you will see that there are versions of these documents linked to this one which contains also why we came up with some of these decisions. So you can, you can see also the brainstorming behind this. So it has been a very nice moment. Um, yeah, the expectation is to release <laughs> uh, the new database by Q1 2024, maybe Q2. So, <laughs> so in April, I, I was just writing Q1, now I add Q, Q2, we don't know. <laughs> It's a lot. It's a lot of work. I mean, it's a lot of work, and the team is incredible. But they are just in a limited number of hours in a day, so it's really a lot of work. Um, oh, the, the one more thing. The one more thing is uh, these stickers. <laughs> Did you get the stickers yet? No, please run <laughs> in case you don't have. So I come from another community, the R community. I've been a, an R developer for for like 20 years of my life. And uh, at some point, someone came up with this idea. Why don't we create a sticker for, for R? Why don't we create a sticker for an R package? And now we have like thousands of stickers. And every year, at the, the equivalent of the community meeting, um, we put all these stickers together. We create maps. We create co contests, which is the best stickers for this year community event. So my proposal now is to launch this challenge to all the installation, or even when we have these, with these modules um, for the modules. So next year, um, this is the challenge. You come up with your own Dataverse stickers, and we will share these stickers, and we make a competition uh, to decide which is the best stickers for, for 2024 community meeting. And so our laptop will be full of these stickers <laughs> at some point. So, so if you want to participate to this, to this challenge, please ask Dwayne. Where is Dwayne? I should be here somewhere. Okay? So Dwayne has the, the template, so you can personalize your template and you can share with the community next year. So enjoy the conferences, the conference, all the meetings that we are, uh, coffee breaks, and thanks again.
Thanks, Vim uh, Hugo from Dance. So we're, of course, very, uh, let's say, grateful and uh, wait in great anticipation for the release of the, the new architecture because in parallel we've anticipated this and started developing, let's say, um, uh, loosely coupled components and uh, enhancements to Dataverse uh, using React. Mm -hmm. So we, we're hopefully well aligned already. But I'm hoping that one can align much more closely because yesterday when you were discussing uh, the <coughs> details of the re-architecture uh, project, it became clear to me that if we can get some input from you, some formal input from you, that's just short maybe of sharing the code in, in GitHub, that we can make sure that it's as painless as possible for us to integrate what we are already busy with, uh, with your efforts. Yeah, I mean, I think definitely that's a great idea. And I mean, I think in the past we've always said, you know, when you're working on something relating to Dataverse, to try to talk to us early in the process because the earlier, then the more we can coordinate and catch things that, you know, how things connect and integrate and things like that. So especially, generally I think that's true, but especially with this re-architecture and with the fact that you already are working on other React components, for sure, um, let us know, communicate with us, and we can help out. Yeah, these slides maybe it's, it's really kind of an answer to what you're asking. So the idea is that we are developing this JS Dataverse library and the design system. So it's pieces of code that you can re reuse for your own code, which makes this very easy to, to implement stuff. Yeah. That's the idea. More questions or comments or? We have the microphone open. Merci. Hello. First of all, I'm so excited about the, this new architecture. This is great. So congratulations to the team, uh, to all of you and Stefano. Uh, just, uh, maybe I just didn't get all the pieces, but uh, the Dataverse front end will be fully developed also by the core, or uh, you could rep create a whole Dataverse front end for your installation also, um, so in parallel, I mean, it, but maybe it's connected to uh, what, what, uh, the, the previous question, but it's just uh, not only the plugins, but the entire front end, if uh, there is a default front end that works uh, for everybody or you change it. Yeah, yeah the idea that we, we start providing, say, the official front end, so the SPA will be developed by the same team uh, of Dataverse. Um, there are two GitHub repositories. Now they are merged together, but there, there will be two different repositories because they have different cycles. But the idea is that everyone can build its own uh, uh, front end. Maybe they don't need some functionalities, they want other functionalities, they can just do it. And they can reuse all the elements that we make available to the community. So not just for the plugin, but also for the UI. I mean, how does that, I mean, I think that is exactly the point. And we think about now, installations can make changes to the front end now, but if they do, they need to fork the project because it's all a, together as one thing with the back end. Going forward, the back end, you know, it would be the exact same back end. There'd be no reason to fork the back end, and your front end would just be its own separate project and, you know, would evolve with the back end as time goes on. Okay. Are we done? Or any other question or comment? No? So thank you. Uh, Gustavo and Stefano, so let's, let's start. Uh, let's continue. We don't go out from this room, so we just stay here. Uh, we will have two, two moments. One is a surprise, the other one is uh, what we have in the, in the plan, okay? So I will ask the, the poster presenters to, to come like, closer to this area, okay? Because you will have one minute to present your poster just Okay. Um, so if you can sit uh, there or there, so the presentation will follow the, the order that is in the in the agenda. Okay. Um, we will start with the uh, Upverse, a desktop application for uploading folder structures into Dataverse repositories. Okay. It will be 
quite active moment, so great. But before, what we are going to, to have is that we invite the, the community to send us videos uh, from the, insta the different installations. So we will, f we will have a, a, a complete video with all the videos that we received. Uh, we received, um, so you, you can sit if you, if you want, you can sit. Just sit, don't. So we received uh, 14 uh, videos. Um, so we, uh, we, we, we have already here the first two. And every, every session before we go to the coffee break, we just uh, will present two videos that we have received. So we received 14 and we will have groups of two, two like uh, three, four minutes of a video we can watch. I will just ask the, 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 um, the guy that is ensuring the broadcast if we, we will have sound. I think everything will do works well. True? Yes, I suppose yes. Let, let's test. <laughs> Researcher. Looking for a way to satisfy the requirements of the tri-agency RDM policy or journal policies? Borealis, the Canadian Dataverse Repository, is a bilingual, multidisciplinary and secure research data repository. Borealis is hosted on Canadian infrastructure and supported by academic libraries and research institutions across Canada. The service supports researchers who are affiliated with participating Canadian institutions, research organizations and their collaborators. Our mission is to enhance open sharing, discovery, access, preservation, and reuse of research data. Borealis supports the FAIR principles to help make your data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Borealis automatically assigns a Digital Object Identifier, or DOI, to every dataset, allowing your research data to be both accessible and citable. We make it easy for you to apply clear reuse licenses that include rich metadata description based on disciplinary standards, facilitate collaboration amongst your research team through flexible permissions and versioning features, and securely save your research data on Canadian storage. Make an impact with your research by visiting us at borealisdata.ca. We would like to thank our partners, including academic libraries, regional library consortia, research organizations, and the Digital Research Alliance of Canada for their ongoing support. I am Jetze Tauber. And I'm Marion Wittenberg. We are data station managers working at DANS, which stands for Data Archiving and Networked Services. DANS is the national center of expertise and repository for research data in the Netherlands. DANS started in 2014 with Dataverse NL, a repository service available to universities and research institutes. We offer Dataverse NL alongside our own data repository EASY, accessible to individual researchers. When EASY needed a technical update, and given our good experiences with the Dataverse software for Dataverse NL, we decided to switch to the Dataverse software for the makeover of EASY as well. EASY, which was a generic data repository, is being transformed into four domain-specific data stations, all built on the Dataverse software. The Archaeology Data Station has been online since June 2022. The Social Sciences and Humanities Data Station will be launched this month. And the Data Station for the Life, Health and Medical Sciences and the Data Station for the Physical and Technical Sciences will be available this autumn. All datasets in EASY will be migrated to these four new services. The data stations contain domain-specific metadata and give access to domain-specific controlled vocabularies. Moreover, we are building specific additional tools on top of the data for software to serve our designated communities. Our CTO, Wim Yuko, will be present at the Dataverse community meeting. He will present a poster on our new Dataverse-based repositories. He can answer all your questions concerning these new developments. So, great.
great that we have these videos. I think it's in interesting that we will have like this three or four minutes per, per session. Thank you to Paula Moura that managed to create these uh, blocks of the videos, so great. So let's start with, um, with the poster Midnight Madness. So who is the first one that will... So you have one minute uh, for your information. So we will have here a counter to support you, okay? <laughs> and then we can, we don't start, we, I'm just training, giving you some time, okay? So we will have a, a timer and then you, we can make an applause at the end, okay? So, let's start. Wow. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, you need to thank you. In order to help our researchers to upload uh, scientific data structures into our uh, database repository, uh, quickly and without uh, getting distracted by technical stuff, the Max Planck Digital Library uh, developed Abels, an easy-to-use interactive tool that helps to do this in just a few steps. We hope uh, Abels will be helpful uh, for our researchers to gain a valuable uh, time. Uh, if you have any further questions, we will be happy to answer them uh, during uh, the coffee break. Thank you so much. So you have some time available. Yo, let's try to use this microphone if possible. Okay, I will give you some space here, okay. <laughs> let's go in the next step. We go directly to, to Lebanon. True? Do you want to speak? Yes. Hi. Uh, so the Arab Public Data Initiative is a partnership between uh, the Arab Council for the Social Sciences, uh, the Odom Institute, and recently, as of January, Oxford University. We're trying to achieve three things. Uh, one is the preservation of social science data sets uh, in and on the Arab region. We're doing it through the Insta Dataverse installation, and Odom is helping us with the back end uh, of the, uh, of the uh, software. The second thing we're trying to achieve is uh, to increase capacity around um, data management and sharing across the region um, and uh, uh, through a series of workshops. And these workshops are uh, including uh, most of those who are uh, wor uh, and, uh, working on the life cycle of the data. So we have librarians and researchers. And the third thing, is uh, we want to forge partnerships to expand our work on this. So far, we have one formal uh, uh, partnership with uh, an eco economic research forum in the region. Okay, from Lebanon to Belgium. So the um, data set claimer, semi-automatic registering externally published data sets. Yes, so um, outside of our Dataverse, we decided to also provide a way of registering externally published data sets because we allow our researchers to also publish in domain-specific repositories. But how do we know where they've published it except if they tell us where it was? And we've basically decided to create a little tool that fits in right in the middle of our architecture where all the way on the left top corner you actually see our Dataverse. But we set up a tool that allows us to pull in the metadata that we can find in aggregators like OpenAir and Datasite to register the metadata of externally published data sets in our CRIS system so that we can report on. Now, if it gets sent to a CRIS system or something else, that's really the last step of the tool. But the, I think, interesting thing is that we basically try to avoid our researchers to duplicate metadata input by pulling it in from aggregators. I think we use OpenAir and Datasite for it. Um, and if you have any other questions about that entire little picture, then you can also come to that poster. Okay, Great. thank you. And then okay. I have another poster. <laughs> another blue poster, let's go. <laughs> yeah, it's our branding. Everything is always blue, so sorry for that. Um, the other part is more the, what we call the functional side, so really focusing on everything that came with launching our repository in uh, 2022, so we're relatively new to the Dataverse story. But it started way back in 2019, actually even before but that, but that was really <coughs> the first step to make it more practical and start launching a repository. And so I basically wanted to provide an option to really find out 
all the non-technical people that were involved in creating the repository because it was a lot of people like the legal department and a lot of librarians and data stewards. And this is really the story that it tells on how those preparatory phases were necessary to get to the technical implementation. Because I have to say, the technical implementation was kind of the easiest part. Um, so if you have any questions about that, then you can come to that poster. I think both of them are on the same board, but backing each other, so they should be relatively findable with the blue. Thank you. So now the, the first port poster from Portugal. So. So, good morning. Uh, my name is José. I come from the University uh, of Aveiro, and I would like to invite you all to, to join us, me and my colleagues Pedro and Rita, on booth number five, to get to know DUNAS, which is the um, institutional repository for research data from the University of Aveiro, which is now uh, almost one year old. So, we look forward to, to, to talking to all of you, so come and see us. Thank you. Great. From Dunas to Indores, let's go. So from blue to purple with, uh, with us. So Indor is a project, a French project for uh, environmental and ec ecological research data. And uh, we provide help for researchers. And we have a unique entry point. Uh, where you can find documentations about open access, open science, and fair principles. And we have tools that we provide for the community. Uh, we have a metadata catalog, and we also have a repository with Dataverse. And um, we try to help researchers to publish and to be comfortable with fair principles. And we are going to put together training classes to help everyone, and uh, we really want to have a thematic, national thematic repository for environmental and ecological research data. So come see us if you have questions. You. University of Stuttgart, present here also. Hello everyone, um, I would like to share with you our work of, uh, on the integration of OpenTOSCA ecosystem with uh, Dataverse, aiming to automatically deploy and manage research software applications. Our goal is to support both uh, research software engineers and uh, their users uh, with the help of graphical user interface winery. Uh, developers can model their application and uh, package their code together with dependencies, metadata, and uh, suitable license into automatically deployable research object. Interested users do not have to uh, install and run the software themselves, but uh, can use it directly into a cloud environment. Uh, thank you. If you have any question, please come. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. So we stay in Germany, but with a, a colleague, sorry, with a colleague from Nepal. Thank you. Uh, hello, good morning, everyone. My name is Lincoln, and I'm working in uh, at uni uh, Technical University of uh, Dresden. Uh, so my poster is about a project called Keen, which is uh, which is uh, a project consisting of 25 industrial partners as well as research institutions. The main motto being applying AI in the process industry and uh, evaluating the pro uh, evaluating the capabilities of AI. So uh, the the poster which I'm trying to present here is consists of uh, four different sections. The first one is about the motivation uh, regarding uh, why to use Dataverse as a central uh, repository and what are the advantages of it. The second one is about the requirements where we ask the, where we had asked uh, asked the project members about what the requirements were and how it is matching with the Dataverse promises. And then the third is about uh, including of the metadata schema. That is why, uh, I mean, uh, this is done uh, in order to bridge the gap of contextual understanding between uh, two different <laughs> domains. And then the last but not the least is about the use cases. Sorry. Okay. okay. Computer says no. So from uh, our friends from Autumn Institute. 
The uh, University of North Carolina School of Medicine approached John Crabtree and asked for a suitable replacement archive and presentation platform. Hmm? Yes, keep, keep Okay. <laughs> they are friends, so I, I did it. Okay. <laughs> to, uh, to, to store HIPAA classified clinical trial research data. And this poster chronicles the process of the security reviews and security controls necessary to get the platform approved for storing and serving sensitive data within Amazon. Thank you. Vim. Vim is here to explain everything about DENS, as someone already said today. DENS data stations. Yes, so I'm not going to elaborate too much on what was said in the video because I think we've already had our slot, so I'm donating my time to the next person. I'll be at the poster. Thank you. Okay, Oliver. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Oliver from Forschungszentrum Mülich in Germany. Um, also, this poster is not just me, but we're working together on a lot of this stuff. Um, making research software fair and publishing is crucial to reproducibility of research, credibility of RSEs, and recognition as a first-class scholarly output. And Dataverse, as a well-known and acknowledged solution to data publication, needs to level with other repository solutions, like Igvenio, our microcore, and others, to stay relevant with this, this new publication infrastructure. And with Project Hammers, a solid automated workflow to create metadata-rich software deposits and publications, is appearing on the horizon, already successfully uh, depositing towards Invenio, and we're eager to do the same with Dataverse. And my poster here is about the motivational <laughs> details, why we, what we can do with like uh, Dataverse development, where we are with software support, what has been achieved, and the roadmap to the next steps to making Dataverse reset software ready. Okay, next presenter. So again, University of Stuttgart, again, research software. So come to me if you want to know more about how research software can be made available. Just another way, in this case, in a configurable web app, um, by simply putting a containerized version of this research software together with a configuration file um, into Dataverse. We did this um, by integrating our Dataverse instance with a virtual programming lab software named WebLab as an external tool capable of running containers, parameterizing the software, providing input files, and returning visualizations and output files. <clears throat> Great. Thank you very much. Now, upcoming new version of Dataverse, a new installation of Dataverse in Portugal. It is great to hear about. It's an hospital. Thank you. Okay. Um, we are a, a university hospital. Our mission is triple, provide health care, to do research and to collaborate in education and training. Many researchers uh, look for us and come to us to obtain data for research. We have a methodology approved by national authority for data protection, reidentification and in risk reidentification, so we can provide real world data uh, complying with the law. Uh, we need a, a, a publication repository and we have selected and choose Dataverse. This is a, a very active community, so we believe it's the best solution to us. Uh, so uh, we believe our work can contribute to make hospitals aware and it is important to get ready for open data for research. Thank you. Okay. Great control, control of installations and great control of the time. Odum Institute friends again. Good morning, I'm John Martin. Um, our motivation with this project was to reduce the amount of human input in user testing, which seems perhaps counterintuitive, but um, we, as part of a uh, 21 CFR Part 11 validation process, we needed to reduce the ability of a user testing the environment from one upgrade to the next 
to find workarounds that would reflect uh, you know, the sort of human ability to, to work through breaking changes that would actually unvalidate our environment. And so the, the user testing suite, the synthetic testing suite that we devised um, will allow us to instead see when a breaking change actually breaks the user interaction and then requires uh, either a revalidation or a change order. And I'll be out there with Thank more you. information. Thanks. Hello. The last one, we finish with the University of Minho and yes. Antonia. Hi all, so uh, I'm Antonia and I will be telling you about our strategy to promote the usage of the open, uh, of our data repository, uh, data repositorium. So this is a key uh, factor uh, in our open science strategy and so we, we aim to promote it and to engage our researchers into using it. And we are doing it by promoting roadshows, so we are contacting the, the research centers in order to do uh, hands-on sessions in, in their centers and to engage people into usage. Uh, we already went to 12 research centers and uh, have achieved uh, two th uh, 200 researchers and promoting the, the usage and uh, answering questions. Then we also, produ we also produce some uh, video t tutorials in Portuguese uh, to allow people to easily understand how to use and access this anytime they, they want. Uh, we also do training and uh, insert hands-on sessions on the uh, open data uh, school, winter school. And, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> too much time. So you can visit us at booth 15. Thank you. Okay. okay, so we are done this uh, session. So we will have now one hour for coffee, for some cakes, and of course to network and to uh, join the posters to talk with uh, the presenters. I think it's a good moment for networking. Feel free also to uh, work here in the room if you want uh, uh, to check your mails, but the moment is for networking a bit with uh, the other calls and the presenter. So it will be outside. You know where are the posters in front of the reception. I just ask to come five minutes before the next session that will be 45 minutes past 11. So come um, five minutes before, okay? Thank you all.
said he was going to help drive for us. So he had uh, he had them here. I saw them a minute ago. So he's going he's going to control it and turn them on. You'll have about seven minutes. Yeah. Like is, he, is he going to give me the screen? No, no, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to be I'm going to be down there and wave at you when when it gets up time and, and we're going to hold questions at the end and then we'll all come up front with questions. Like you said. Well, there's only the, one of them is a recording, uh, so there's only six of us and two of them Slav is doing. Yeah. <laughs> So I see her way at the back back there. I guess it's right. So, so. This is one of the first one? That's the second one. Uh -huh. Yeah, here she comes. So she's second. Jim's first. QDR. Yeah, Jim's first. I have, I have this first and the second ready, so I, can, I, I will support them if you can present them. Maybe you can go in the microphone. Yeah, yeah, okay. So welcome everyone. We'll get started with our first session of lightning talks here. One thing that uh, Jim and I were just talking about, it's so exciting that so much work is going on that we have to have lightning talks because there's so much going on. We don't have time in three days to talk about in long sessions. So uh, be sure to touch base with all of these folks in between the sessions uh, at coffee breaks. Uh, because it's so much exciting work going on. Uh, Tumai and I were just walking down the posters 
choosing the things that we want to use at UNC. There's so much exciting stuff going on. Uh, these will be lightning talks, about seven minutes, maybe eight at the most. Uh, and I'll kind of wave uh, at our participants. And at the end, if we would hold our questions to the end, we'll get up here and, and have our uh, questions all together at the end. We hope to have enough time for that. Uh, and we have one video. One person was not able to attend, so we got a video from them. Uh, so uh, I guess we'll start off with uh, Jim from QDR, talking about some exciting work they're doing. So one of my hats along with GDCC is I work directly for the Qualitative Data Repository in Syracuse. Um, and I want to tell you about our work with uh, OpenID Connect there today. Um, as soon as I can figure out how to make the slide go. Um, no, I got out of it, sorry. Just click there. Yeah, I hit it too far over, I think. Um, so QDR is a participant in the National Institutes of Health uh, program called HEAL that's about ending addictions. Um, read it because I'm moving on um, and <laughs> we'll keep going. Um, HEAL, the way it's set up is that there's a central data platform where search and discovery is going to be done from underlying repositories like QDR and Harvard and others, sorry, 20 plus. And the idea is that data submitters are putting their data in repositories, they're getting searched and discovered out there, and when you find the data, it's pulled back into that platform where they have analysis tools and, and other things. Um, technically, what that means is that their system is sitting over there using our APIs, right, the Dataverse APIs, to get information out about what data sets exist. If the data is open, they can pull it directly without the person logging in. And then the fun part for, for today is that if it is restricted data, Right, they have to send that person back to Dataverse to, to go and ask to make the request for data access, get the approval, and then they're able to pull stuff over. So the two things I outlined in blue there, basically that redirect, it would be awful nice if that were a single sign-on and that the account you were using over there was the same account used in Dataverse. And same thing, if that's the same account, then they can go in with authorization directly through the API and go get stuff out. So um, that may or may not sound familiar yet, but um, so for us, um, QDR is slightly different than a lot of places where we've got Dataverse and Drupal working together and we've already done some work sort of specially to use Shibboleth to do single sign-on between those uh, components. And the key thing here is it's Shibboleth with LDAP below it as our database. So all our built-in users are sitting over in LDAP. Um, that's not too important here, but now with Heal, we want to do things like that with Google users. Um, and so we can't just connect Dataverse to Google um, the, way, the way it's set up now because that loses our single sign-on with Drupal. So we have to do some more work. Um, you may not want to care about all of that, but if you were in the session yesterday, um, you know that OIDC is coming with a new SPA. So we thought, great, here's our chance to basically do what you're going to have to do with the SPA anyway and do it now for Dataverse because we need this functionality now. So that's essentially, you know, you may be interested in what we're doing because um, it's also going to be the way that we have to do things uh, with the new SPA. Um, so the new design here is basically using, as we, we were talking yesterday, Dataverse talks this, this OpenID Connect protocol to a broker, Keycloak in the middle, which we have running in a container, and then it's Keycloak's job to connect to Google, connect to Orchid, to connect to our LDAP users, and it's all configuration over there. So compared to right now where Dataverse, if you're going to have multiple providers, you set them all up in Dataverse, now the idea is one connect over to a broker and then everything's connected from there. So that's basically what we've set up. Um, that allows us to basically, when people create a Google account over at Heal, they come in. Um, the one thing we've added in here is that uh, the normal process for doing OIDC login is you get sent to the login page. One of the things that Dataverse has with Shibboleth is a passive login. So in our case, if you log in with Shibboleth over at Drupal, when you come to Dataverse, it says, let me go check with Shibboleth, and if they've already logged in, I don't even have to show them the login page. I just, boom, they're, they're logged in. So OIDC, um, we've made some changes that I have to get pushed back into Dataverse that does the same thing. If you're already logged in through OIDC and you come to Dataverse, it doesn't have to send you through the user login page. You'll just be logged into Dataverse directly. Um, so what that looks like in practice is we now have, instead of the choices on Dataverse, you have a single you know, login button in there. Um, the central thing looks more like Dataverse, but that's Keycloak, where you have the choice of username, password, do use Google, use Orchid, and once you click OK, you're off into Dataverse as normal. 
Um, and again, if you've, you've already logged in there, um, you skip that middle part and you're directly in Dataverse and everything's going. Um, so our key findings this is, you know, Keycloak, we, none of us in the community, I think, had much experience with it. Um, we've really tried to dig into the inside and um, the amount of stuff you can do to configure different sources to make sure you're getting the same information from all of those sources, the, the way you can put theming for your institution in Keycloak along with Dataverse, um, it's all there, so we're learning and hopefully trying to provide that information back out to all you guys. Um, and it is a way that I think the single sign-on, the way we're talking about with SPA, you know, that's going to be something that's going to be doable to, to do this kind of brokering in the middle. Um, so with that, um, it, you know, happy to get off the stage and, and talk to you all later about it, but thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I do think Key Coke is in the future for many of us. I know at UNC we've already got our radar up to look for Key Cloak. So uh, next we have uh, KU Levin in Devacha is going to present on uh, uh, some work they're doing to connect related publications and authors. Thank you, John. Uh, so yeah, my name is Dieberche Blume and um, I'm the product manager of what we say Radar, but it's written as RDR. My colleagues uh, Eric and Oscar are here as well, but uh, Chris couldn't be here even though he developed what I'll be presenting today. So a bit of background, because I know last year there was a bit of confusion about it, but we are part of Libis, which is the digital service provider for KU Leuven and KU Leuven libraries, especially focusing on metadata solutions, of which our Dataverse instance is something. So I'm talking about lookups and specifically for um, the author fields and the related publication fields, but how was the situation before we actually implemented these lookups, which is probably the situation most of you are in. So it was a lot of manual work. If you wanted to add an author, it is the typical last name, first name, affiliation, hopefully an ID if they think of it. And it's always copy and pasting your ORCID because I don't think a lot of people know it by heart. And for your latest publication fields, we found it to be even more annoying because you have to supply the citation in APA style, which we've noticed while we were even just testing our Dataverse in Pilot that it's kind of frustrating to do it again and again. So we would also understand why some people didn't do it. For the ID, I want to point out we have an extra field which is called a Lirias ID. Lirias is our Chris system and each publication there has its own unique ID. So we also ask our researchers to fill it in where possible so that we can connect for the author fields, one of the most frequent issues we saw in the review phases is that the ORCID just wasn't filled in. Even though they had one, they just couldn't be bothered to give it. Uh, that the, if the affiliation was given uh, differently each time. We have a very long history at our university with many name changes, and each of them would appear in data sets. And they would also supply their name in the first name, last name order, which is always fun. And for the related publication, we saw that the citation was unformatted. It was just the title of a publication. Sometimes there was no ID, and it was just not quick enough to find the information to allow them to fill it in. So most people just didn't supply a related publication, even though it's such a valuable field to have. So why is it worth the effort to improve these input methods? For the author fields, it was for us really important to be able to connect what we have in our Dataverse with what is in our Chris system, which means that we had to be able to uniquely identify our users to enable the import to our Chris system. So we had to have a unique identifier in the form of an ORCID. That's why it was worth it. And for the related publication, basically the same thing. We need to have a unique identifier to match them to. And for the users to simplify the input, of course, to lower the review issues, which is the same for our latest publications. And secretly also because we have a lovely thing called the Open Science KPIs for the Flemish government. Uh, and they basically count for authors the number of ORCID IDs that researchers funded by the Flemish government have. So we try to sort of boost that number by saying that it's necessary to register an ORCID in our SAP system, but also add ORCID to the input to properly link, but also to report to the government. But the one that I'm actually responsible for is the Open Data KBI, which counts the number of data sets linked to publications that are linked to projects funded by the Flemish government. And for that, we need the link between publications and data sets in our CRIS system, and additionally, the link to projects. Now, the link to projects is a bit more difficult. We have it in our CRIS system that it inherits it from the publications, so that's kind of fine. 
But we need that initial link between the publication and the data set, so we need to incentivize our researchers to actually register that link as much as possible. So that's why we went forward with the implementation of the lookups. Now, some of you might be familiar with what we've basically done, but we've done it slightly different because it's based on the uh, work by the GDCC and DANS on external vocabularies and the lookups that they've created for the ORCID. Um, and we haven't actually used that one. So we, we set up a different one that we've also contributed in the same repository on GitHub. Um, why didn't we use the ORCID lookup? Because we noticed that our researchers were very strong at creating multiple ORCIDs for themselves and just using them nilly-willy whenever they wanted. So that was not really great. And on top of that, the data that we could pull from ORCID just wasn't up to date. The email address often wasn't their professional email address. That's going to cause issues in the review phase if we send it back to them. So we really needed to set up it custom anyway for the related publication, so we also did it for the authors. The author lookup is uh, based on a nightly load of our HR data, which is exemplified in our public uh, platform where you can find all our personnel uh, members. And it uses the Kovac server, just like with the ORCID ID that Dance has created. And uh, the information that we import is the name, obviously, the ORCID ID, but also the email address and the U number. The U number is our unique personal identification within the university. Uh, and why have we added those last two? The email address is important for the contact uh, person, but the U number is also really useful if you have multiple people. So currently, it works like this. You just click the uh, search button. But even now, I just typed in uh, our um, boss, basically, and there are multiple Bart Peters, and it's a very common name. You'll see it a lot in Flanders, names that just keep repeating themselves. And we need the U number, but also the email address to very easily identify which Bart Peters I actually want to pull in. And uh, you can search on the U number, ORCID ID, if they know it, and also on their email address, because that's typically, if you want to add a colleague to an author, the data that you're absolutely sure of that it's exactly that person because it's just in your email box. And then it just fills in all the relevant data. And then, a bit more complicated, we did something very similar for the related publications in that we set up a live connection via the Kovac server to uh, the search API of our Chris system, which we call Limo Lirias, and then also to the Lirias cache because, sadly enough, our search API did not include citation or at least not formatted citation but our cache did, so that's where we pull it from. We pull in the DOI, the Lirias ID, and then the citation in APA style. And again, they can search on a number of different uh, queries, like the name, U number, keywords, DOI, the full title, or their ORCID. Um, bit of a brief show of this is what's in our cache, so that's why we were able to pull the APA style from it, because that's basically right what was already there, so we could reuse it. But the U number really turned out to be an incredible, incredibly important search query because it was a one-way stop, basically, to get all the publications that are already attached to your account in our case system. Here I did it with my name, but basically you just get an overview of all the titles that are attached to your publication. They link to the public page that you can see the record on, and then you just click on import and all the fields are filled in. And obviously, it's great that we have a well-formatted citation field, but also we have IDs to uh, properly link when we do an export. Now, a bit of a look back on apparently the lessons we learned, but I mean, meant the lessons. Um, we really noticed that implementing the lookups has greatly improved the correct input. We have to review the author fields and the related publications quite a lot less. And we noticed that publications are more often uh, filled in than before. So it really is a huge benefit um, to use these. And because the CRIS system is also within our management, we really notice that that's a huge benefit that we have. We have control over all the metadata within the university, so it's really easy to interconnect the different systems. Our next job on the list of uh, simplifying the input is now to improve how we fill in keywords. And that's how we're looking uh, forward to basically improving it further, and we're probably going to use the, um, I think it's the Scosmos <coughs> setup that uh, Dance has been working on, uh, because the keywords are now the most frequent issue in review. So yeah, if you want to look at our Dataverse, that's the info. We have documentation that's openly available. And if you have any questions, come find me or send an email to that uh, help desk address. Thank you. Thank you, Divisha. Um, Slava is going to present some great work by Dons.
next, talking about some machine learning libraries. Okay, so I don't think I, I need to introduce dance because <laughs> now you know what dance does. Uh, just a few words uh, about uh, my contribution. First, I was con concentrated on data archiving. So dance stands for data archiving and network services. So I was con concentrated on data archiving, which is Dataverse. And this presentation is about network services, well, second part of our name. So. Everything goes to archive in the box. This is what we do for years, and this is what we tried uh, from the uh, moment when Dance was founded. And what we managed to do is really unique setup that allows to integrate any kind of network services inside. So if you have uh, any Docker container, you already compliant to this. And I was really happy about presentation of Stefano yesterday because uh, IQSS team is moving in the same direction, and you can use it right away. So if you uh, just connect uh, your own Docker images to this infrastructure, it will work. And it will be connected to our services that we already have inside. And as you see, uh, we also added some useful stuff like Cosmos integration also in Docker and everybody can just get it installed in a few minutes. And uh, we're going to demonstrate this today, like in two minutes, basically you'll, you'll get completely operational uh, Dataverse uh, running uh, on any cloud. So benefits are clear, I think, because now everybody can just uh, get our infrastructure and get it installed in, in your place with own credentials, and you can start deposit data. So this is very simple, and uh, some people already started to do that. So uh, further, we'll have presentation of Dataverse and all, which is also using the same setup with a bit different services, but still it works. And it also allows to uh, share knowledge between different countries and probably with different continents after the Harvard Dataverse will start to, to use the same setup. So you can get a lot of time and money really saved and you can spend this time and money to do something nice. So this is also a very important concept and uh, the team of uh, Stefan is not there yet. However, this is important because we're using a cloud supported, uh, cl native cloud uh, uh, proxy called traffic and this is what traffic does. So you have, if you have some service, which is deployed with Docker image, and you, you can quickly connect it inside of distribution, and uh, basically there is unlimited amount of services you can use at the moment. And following this approach, we're managing to build uh, super infrastructures with hundreds of services interconnected and also connected to Dataverse. So whatever processing, uh, data processing uh, will, pro uh, will produce, it will be stored in Dataverse and after it could be uh, also uh, downloaded from Dataverse and uh, used in other processes. So this is really a good foundation for semantic search and I know it was big discussion for years who is going to implement this and how it's going to work, but I think we are getting close because now from just uh, aggregation, which is done in centralized way, we are going to distribute the setup, and we already implemented a few proof concepts. And basically, this is what I see as a kind of a sustainable uh, um, approach. When Dataverse can be uh, uh, deployed, some data could be uh, deposited inside, and after it could be destroyed, after researchers will do some data processing. <laughs> But still data will be uh, archived in, in S3 sup, uh, supported storage or something like that. And metadata will be available in a distributed ledger, for example, blockchain. We did some experimentations and it works great. And probably this is kind of future direction where everybody should look for. So this is also a very interesting uh, proposal. And uh, our CTO, Wim Hugo, is the co-author of this proposal. So it's about semantic mappings. It was discussion about different disciplines. Everybody has own metadata blocks. So there is a question how to uh, map those metadata blocks to each other and if it's possible. So if that's possible, we can think about some Dataverse instance uh, running for social sciences and humanities. And after metadata could go to, let's say, life sciences with different metadata blocks, still metadata will be the same and they will be linked in knowledge graph. And this functionality that we contributed with external controller calendars, actually it allows to do that because from just simple uh, keywords, we are shifting all attention to knowledge graphs. 
And next slide, this is also very important. So metadata schema also can be expressed as notch graph with triples. As you see, compound keyword field uh, is uh, serialized with scores, and this scores also is something like uh, basis for Cosmos. So you can quickly integrate different systems to work together, and you can query knowledge graph to get all stuff from it. So we implemented a so-called CMF client. It's available as open source. Everybody can just try it. And now I'm coming to even more interesting point. So we started to experiment with machine learning in a project called Claria. This is uh, Dutch national infrastructure. So we actually started to work on the workflow that allows to predict and to link different concepts. So we, what we want, we want the process that will get uh, some web page. It will recognize uh, all components, like this is title, this is text, and this is some keywords, and uh, this is image. And it should be able to generate metadata automatically based on this. So we managed to do that. And in the next presentation, we will show how, we, how it works. So this is also very interesting uh, because we connected uh, annotation service to this. And now everything available in Dataverse network also goes through uh, machine learning and natural language processing pipeline. And we are able to enrich any uh, Dataverse, dates, uh, any data set stored in Dataverse with new elements. So this is just demonstration. What it does, it's just uh, uh, getting some text as input and recognizing name entities like uh, person names, uh, organizations, and uh, whatever. You, you can actually put any kind of labels. You can train model, and after it will become part of your metadata record, like mentioned here. So thank you. Thank you, Slava. So Eves is going to continue to talk about a little digital media space and time in a project in collaboration with Slava. the folks at Slava and Dons. Yes, I did it. Yep, super. Thank you. So uh, I will speak about a project which is called uh, Now Museum and uh, which aims to capture uh, digital media. And I'm speaking about space and time, just uh, to recall that uh, the media I'm looking for are all around the world. Uh, actually, we are working on Europe uh, level, but uh, it could be enlarged to the world. And time, because we are doing this capture in real time, inside Dataverse. So, the problem is to capture significant event, and the problem is that we not always know what is a significant event when this significant event appears. And uh, if we think in terms of uh, capturing an event, it has to start as soon as possible, because if you wait too much, the artifact left from this event disappeared, and they disappeared quite fast, in fact. So, if we imagine the COVID, the COVID, it was not clear at the beginning, let's say in uh, December 2019, that COVID will do something on the society or not. And uh, the question was, if it does nothing, okay. If it does something, we should capture it. And then with Slava, we have started to capture, I think, in January 2020, something like this. So straight from the beginning. And uh, if you start to think like this, the goal of this uh, idea is to be able to analyze in the future what was the present. So it's, uh, it's something a little bit strange. Uh, I should recognize that I am a statistician and a Darwinist person, and uh, so uh, my interest is to understand in the future what has happened in the present. A very strange question. So let's try to do this with no delay, and let's try to do this with no selection because nobody can say what will be important in the future from today. Okay, so the idea is capturing today the continuous present and offering tomorrow a view on the past present. So we have developed a Dataverse uh, infrastructure 
and we have net networked services in order to capture public part of uh, social media, newspaper, across Europe in all languages. So I'm French. French is spoken at least in three countries in Europe. France, Luxembourg, Switzerland, if it's uh, Belgium, so four already. And what I can tell is that the development of the COVID in these four countries has been completely different because in France, we have suffered from a lack of masks, for example. So the language, the process of a language in France and in French has been completely different from in Belgium, for example. And to capture this, you need to capture it straightforward. Okay, and uh, what we are trying to develop is a new content viewer and uh, to have integration of uh, data science, uh, IA tools, and uh, semantic web technology. So this is uh, our dataverse and uh, with several collections. I will focus on this collection for uh, on the COVID. So we have uh, social media, newspaper, uh, scanners, interviews. I would like to try to capture all this drawing made by children, which has been a change in the family, for example, to be able to make comparison and uh, to observe how kids have been able to survive to this period of lockdown, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these are the articles we have captured since uh, 2020 more than uh, 100 millions of uh, public part of newspaper, for example. Okay, this is one example of article. Uh, you are happy to know that uh, Vladimir Putin has been uh, vaccinated against COVID three days ago. It's a really a recent paper. And uh, this is also a very important thing, is that champagne in France have been uh, able to survive to COVID. Okay, and uh, these are our metadata, and uh, you see that uh, thanks to the tools that uh, Slava just introduced, we have been able to segment the document, uh, capture control vocabulary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what is the interest? For example, I, I will present just uh, uh, some work of a student I'm working with actually. So this is, the follow-up week by week of the element of language inside the uh, tweeters. So this is week one, week two, week three, week four, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the question is how this vocabulary change along the time, and how have the variation. So this is the same, but with respect to co-occurrence, and naturally, if you think in terms of co-occurrence, next step will be to develop a graph of knowledge and to see the evolution of this graph of knowledge along the time in terms of vocabulary. So, just to say that actually, with respect to viewer, we have developed a timeline, and this is the timeline of the articles produced in Europe. So what is missing and what was uh, promised is to have a selector for languages, for origin of a newspaper, etc., or country. It will probably arrive. And uh, the bubble on the bottom are all these uh, articles. And you have here an article in English, but you have some French, you have some Portuguese, etc., etc. And uh, this is just uh, to finish my talk. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's the, the same timeline in between the beginning when I have started to prepare this talk and when I have finished this talk. So what you can observe is that the timeline is updated in real time because in a few minutes we have had all this article who appeared as a new article in the timeline. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Eves. So now I'd like to invite Jim back to the stage to talk about some big data.
Okay, so let me start with um, last year we were announcing at, at this meeting that we had some initial support for Globus and I reviewed kind of where we were with big data overall and this, this I'll, I'll just go quickly through the same diagram from last year that originally Dataverse was kind of used things up to a gigabyte or so. Um, after that we started doing direct uploads to S3 which allows your data to go directly from your site to the S3 store instead of through the Dataverse server, which gets us into things in the you know tens, hundreds of gigabyte range. And to go beyond that, you start wanting to use some more specialized things, one of which is Globus. And if you, if you know that, great. If you don't, the, the two key things about Globus is, one, it does parallel transfer between things. So um, instead of sending all of the data in one stream, it'll actually send data from a group of machines over here, each sending part of a file to a group of machines over there. Um, the second thing it does is it does what, what's called third-party transfer, and what that basically means is from my laptop, I can say, please send the data from there to there, don't pull it to my, my laptop, and then try and send it out, because with the petabyte of data, that's not gonna work. Um, so those two things are what make Globus better and faster than, than HTTP transfer. Um, so if we could support that, we can get into things that are that are even bigger into the you know tens, hundreds, terabytes range. And then you get to a point where the data is so big that even moving it from here to there doesn't make sense. This is the only machine in the world that's big enough to do analysis on that thing, just point to the data. So it, last year, we had basically put together work um, building on stuff that was done originally by Borealis in version 4. something that, that never quite got fully integrated. We merged it in and we set up Globus uh, being able to basically have Dataverse think it was using an S3 store and with some little tweaks inside of Dataverse and an external application, we set up so that Globus can write directly to the S3 store. Dataverse thinks it's mostly S3 and so we get big data without a lot of changes. Um, and at the same time, we also added a mechanism where you can just reference data by a URL and so it looks like a file in Dataverse. You can give it a name and description and everything else you can do with the file. But when you click the download link, we find out that the, the data is still over there and we just send you off to that website and you go, you're actually downloading from over there. So um, those two things we, we kind of last year claimed, look, we've got, we solved the big data problem, we're all good. And of course, this year it's no longer good enough. Um, so the two things that, that are, the, the set of things that kind of make that not good enough is one, um, the simple things like that S3 connector is an extra charge from Globus. Um, that, so if you set it up, you've got to be in their premium package and things. Um, the way Globus works in the world is they think about putting access controls on a folder and our Dataverse stores put all the files for a single data set in the same folder. So that means you can't restrict one file and unrestrict the other file in Globus because their access model and our store model don't, don't work together. Um, so basically what we said, we flipped a switch and made it, if you're using Globus, it's got to be all public data. You can't turn on restriction and embargo for last year. Um, the other thing is that um, people who are doing this, like Harvard, um, are actually using a really large tape store. So the idea is that with Globus, um, you'll have a set of machines that's getting stuff in and puts it in a cache, and then you're actually sending it off to a tape robot to make it cheaper to store things long term. Um, one, when you're setting up for really big data, like I said a minute ago, you have parallel endpoints, and now you have to set up a whole bunch of parallel S3 endpoints that you're not using normally just for Dataverse, which is a pain. Um, and the other thing is that Dataverse, because it's been thinking of this as, as a live store, expects that I should be able to give you a download link and it's going to happen immediately. And with tape stores, if you request the data, it may take a few hours before that tape is loaded back in and you can get the stuff back. So these things made it hard to do things the way we were doing it last year and really support this. Um, the other thing is that uh, Globus doesn't always have a URL, so doing that remote reference um, was a little bit hard. And in fact, if you do set up your Globus to use a, a HTTP URL, it actually sets you up for an HTTP download, right? And so it doesn't, it doesn't send you to Globus to start a transfer of that thing. So you're basically giving somebody a download to a petabyte of data to their local, you know, their local laptop again, which is not what we wanted. So this year, what, what we're building in, in process right now is basically rethinking the design on this and leveraging this idea of, of a remote URL. We're trying to make a Globus store that whether it's going to be internal or not, we're keeping track of the Globus endpoint and the paths offset to the file in it in something that we store in Dataverse. And then 
using that same uh, Dataverse Globus app to, if you're going to transfer it, we, we send that information to Dataverse and start the transfer. If you're going to reference it remotely, we're still going to capture that same information and send it to the same Globus store. Th this does a couple things. One, it, it basically makes it so that um, we, we cover both of those use cases and when you go to download it, you're getting back into the application where you can do Globus transfers out. So we, we skip the HTTP issue I just mentioned um, and we sort of unify whether it's stored in a, in a store managed by Dataverse or it's stored in that original remote store, you get the same interface to basically go transfer it off to whatever third machine you want to do. Um, also, because it's our a store now, we can change our store so that we're actually going to store files uh, in different folders, which means we can then have Globus manage access control on those files separately so we can hopefully turn back on embargo and restriction when you're using Globus and, and really big data. Um, and again, that, that sort of the last point here is that that sort of puts the Dataverse Globus app both in the handling the new case of basically referencing things without transferring it along with the transfer in that it did before and it now becomes the mechanism to transfer out because we're not doing the, the uh, direct downloads from the Dataverse interface anymore. Um, so I, I gave a much more complex diagram of all the things going on last year um, in this short talk. Basically the point that the new things here is we're still using the Dataverse Globus transfer app. It does a few more things than last year in this model and we've got a new Globus store and it basically participates um, using a, a, the Globus endpoint, that tape store out there, as though it's just a pure Globus thing. So it's no longer playing games with S3 to make this work. Um, and again, uh, the biggest point of all these talks is that if that doesn't make any sense, come talk to me afterwards because there's not enough time to, to do anything more. Um, so this is in progress right now. Um, I was going to bravely get it all done before the meeting. It didn't happen. Um, <laughs> and and uh, Borealis is going to help with updates on the, on the application, uh, the separate app, and uh, we didn't have time there. So this is probably summer, fall um, that this will be out. So if you're interested in it or want to be early testing on it or anything, let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. So next we have uh, Philippe is going to talk about uh, the cloud migration of Dataverse in O. Yeah, it's me and um, Slav, actually. So um, here on the list you see the, the, our cloud migration team. So it's most of the technical work was done by uh, Loic and Ubi, who are also here. And they got very good help from Slava. And we also have my colleague, uh, Rolf. So um, just briefly about Dataverse NO, it's a national uh, repository for open research data. We now have 14 member institutions and we operate the um, rep repository at our university, the Arctic University of Norway. And a part, as, a, as a part of the strategic plan for, from, from our IT department, uh, Dataverse NO was earlier this year migrated to cloud infrastructure. And Slava will tell you more about the, the technical stuff. Yeah, it's uh, funny. Uh, exactly five years ago, we were standing together at Harvard. You remember? Pre presenting <laughs> this project. <laughs> okay, so uh, data version no, as I already said, is uh, just reusing a uh, concept of archiving the box with some extra services. So we just installed it on Azure Cloud, and uh, now it's supporting also other clouds. And uh, what this was contributed is FADE. This is National Norwegian Federated Authentication Service, which is Shibboleth based. And everybody can get Docker image of this service, now build it itself and uh, use it in your place. And storage, uh, of course, S3 compliant. So this is uh, standard at the moment. And uh, there is also uh, University of Oslo providing S3 storage for Dataverse NO. And also Azure Blob storage is used as a backup. So there is also direct upload and download support of this uh, DV web loader created by Jim. This is really great stuff and you should try it. It, it really works. And uh, some customized changes were dockerized also and available out of the, bo out of the box as a part of uh, this dist distribution. So a bit overview of uh, how it works. So there is of course S3 protocol, everything is dockerized, all services uh, that will be connected uh, in the future also should be decorized and uh, after immediately they will be available as part of this distribution. And benefits, of course, because it's shared infrastructure uh, and uh, big communities behind. So 
action that will be produced by community will be immediately available uh, in Dataverse NO, in Dataverse NL, and uh, other uh, distributions. So this is really great because you can save a lot of time again and, uh, and money. And all Dataverse NO customizations now managed through GitHub repo. So that means that uh, you just need to do it carefully, uh, uh, deposit in, in GitHub, and after Dataverse frontend will be updated, uh, all these changes will be applied. And uh, upgrades to new Dataverse uh, following this approach, they go almost automatically. So if you don't have any uh, SQL scripts, it just basically uh, change in, in version of uh, Dataverse, and after it will be up updated automatically without human. And uh, Docker images, uh, of course, could be shared between all interested parties. That means that, in principle, after we'll be ready, everybody will get a uh, common Docker image and uh, all, everybody will get completely uh, identical uh, Dataverse infra infrastructure deployed in, in own place. And uh, storage layer allows to separate data for different partner institutions and keep them uh, in different buckets. This is also important and this is great fun functionality developed uh, by AQSS. So that means that for institutions like Dataverse and O, you can actually send some data to Oslo, some data to Tromsø, and some other institutions. So this is really great. And uh, infrastructure as a service can be shared with other partner institutions uh, regarding to networking in Azure Cloud. And this is, again, what we're going to demonstrate today. So we created a video presentation, and you can really get something up and running in two or three minutes. And a new setup allows fast integration of any kind of third-party services with Dataverse and no as soon as they dockerized. So, challenges? No, you. Ah, it's your. Okay. It's your. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, during Dataverse uh, uh, cloud migration, uh, we met some, some challenges. So, there are some complications related to Azure configuration. Azure is Microsoft, and sometimes they're doing updates, and it's not really predictable uh, behavior. And uh, we, ha we have to take care about this. And uh, it was, uh, we created a script that basically uh, monitoring, uh, does monitoring of uh, Dataverse instance and does restart automatically. So it's probably one minute uh, when Dataverse will be not available if Microsoft will restart everything, but after it will come back. So that's managed. And also there is a difficulty uh, to keep all affiliations up to date uh, with FADA service. So this is Shibboleth, and sometimes local users, uh, they don't know that they have to use Shibboleth. They are creating uh, local accounts. So this should be, of course, uh, merged also in one account. And in some cases, it's problematic to link uh, user accounts between them because of different authentication types. And, uh, of course, difficult to diagnose errors and failures when uploading uh, two large files, like 50 GB or even 100 GB. So it's not really done well at the moment, and uh, we need to think how to solve this. Thank you, so Here's some future plans about this um, cloud deployment. So we'd like to run Dataverse and now on a Kubernetes platform. Uh, in a more sustainable setup, and we also would like to improve further uh, CI/CD workflow and automated uh, testing for integration integrations. And we are currently working on implementing immutable storage backup as an extra security layer. And one plan is also to implement a metrics portal with more advanced options for both for curators, depositors, and and other stakeholders. Um, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please approach. Uh, I think it's on. If it's technical question, approach Slava, or Loik, or Ubi, and otherwise me. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Philippe and Slava. So we have a video now from the Austrian Social Science Data Archive. Is our last for this session, and then uh, after this video, I'd like to. Invite all the, speakers, research in data sorry, sorry. all the speakers to the stage, and we'll have time for questions before lunch. This talk is about visual search in Dataverse repositories. Let's start with a scenario about searching datasets. Imagine a researcher who is interested in datasets on elections in Austria. They might start with Google and type Election Austria dataset. Fortunately, the first entry shows the data repository for the social sciences in Austria, that is Austar, while the first listed dataset promises cumulative data about national election results in the last 100 years. 
I click on the link to the dataset and enter the dataverse. But since we are searching for survey data and not only election outcomes, we decide to search the archive for all data on elections and type elections in the search all form. As you can imagine, going through all data sets might take a while. The question is, would it help to have a visual approach to finding relevant data sets? Let's find out. My name is Lars Katzmierig, head of Auster, the Austrian Social Science Data Archive. Together with my colleagues from SESTA ERIC and Open Knowledge Maps, we linked our three services together with the search engine base to offer a visual search for social science datasets in Europe. As you can see here, the metadata from Dataverse is aggregated in the SESTA data catalog. The catalog is a collection of social science data archives in Europe. Their OAI endpoint is harvested by the base search engine. Base can also harvest any modern Dataverse installation directly. Open Knowledge Maps then uses the search engine to create visual interfaces for data discovery. This aggregation of metadata from various services in BASE enables Open Knowledge Maps to create the interactive knowledge maps. Now back to practice. Here's an example. The interface is pre-configured to find datasets and ignore articles. I enter the search terms and get a visualization. Datasets are clustered into topics of election studies. You can, for example, find content analysis of the press and parties. Then there's a number of panel studies clustered in the left lower corner, with some studies from the Austrian National Election Study, such as the Multimode Panels Study, among others. Clicking on the link to the data file brings me directly to the Dataverse dataset. I would like to end our visual journey by going back to the topic overview and drill down into the cluster election results, which brings us back to the beginning of our Google search, specifically the first entry of the Google result page, namely the national election results from the last 100 years, which have been published as open data under Creative Commons CC BY license. For those interested in making your own data available for visual exploration, I will now present the second part of the talk. What setup do you need? Firstly, for good results, you need a modern Dataverse version, preferably at least version 13, because the last versions include improvements in the OAI interface and metadata output. Secondly, you need to make sure to be included in the base search engine. Your data can either be included as part of an aggregator like SESTA ERIC or become a content provider directly. The best approach is to first check whether your datasets are already included by searching base. Thirdly, you either set up your own search interface by using OK Maps custom services or guide your users to the OK Maps site. Finally, the credits. The example today was drawn from the Auster Dataverse, but it could work with any modern Dataverse. Auster is a data infrastructure for the social science community in Austria and offers a variety of research support services, primarily data archiving and help with data reuse. Auster makes social science data accessible, creating opportunities for research and data reuse, benefiting science and society. SESTA-ERIC is the consortium of European social science data archives. The mission is to provide a distributed and sustainable research infrastructure, enabling the research community to conduct high-quality research in the social sciences, contributing to the production of effective solutions to the major challenges facing society today, and to facilitate teaching and learning in the social sciences. Open Knowledge Maps is the world's largest visual search engine for research with over 300 million outputs and 25 output types. OK Maps is open and non-profit. It offers open licenses for content data and source code, easy integration in community and infrastructure, co-creation of platform with the community. More information about BASE and the SESTA data catalog is available in the slides. Thanks for listening. So I'd like to invite our speakers to the stage to take some questions.
So if we have any questions from the audience, we can entertain those. And I'll see if I can make sure we get a microphone to each one of you. So I actually have, I'll start off, I have a question for Devacha. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, I think many of our organizations are going to have this connecting with out, external platforms for publications. So you have that, your internal publication management platform. Uh, how could your model be applied to other things? Like, for example, in the, in the U.S., we have the National Library of Medicine that has these types of catalogs of publications. Uh, have you looked at how maybe you could take the same model? Uh, I'd love to repeat that, for example, from our institution. Uh, yeah, I think especially for the related publication, it seems relatively straightforward to change the source of the information, considering that we use um, a search API basically to get the related publication from the only issue issue might be that citation, a formatted citation, because that's not typically a sort of static element in a search API. It's oftentimes generated in the UI. Uh, we were lucky that we had a source for the citation in API style, but yeah, I think the related publication one is probably easiest to replicate with a different source as long as it has a good API, search API to connect to, then that should definitely be possible. Hi, John. I have a question. Yeah, I have a question, and I guess it's for several of you. But uh, so you've talked about both the the CESDA repositories, right? Well, catalog, and also the um, the so social science humanities open cloud. The shop uh, is the. This is more. It's less about the dataverse support, but maybe it's relevant to to the functionality for dataverse, but also the content. So, are the content of the sets, the catalog, the data sets there in shop, in the open cloud? How do they talk to each other? Or do they not talk to each other now? You know, are the data sets? Do, can you find data sets from Cesda in uh, the SSHOC? <laughs> So, uh, yeah, SESDA is a bit um, different use case because they created own catalog, so it's harvesting from Dataverse instances. So still available, but uh, uh, not, I would say, optimal at the moment. They we are considering uh, to move this Dataverse as a, a gator, but uh, still I think this decision is not taken. But okay. it's available, yeah, you can search in, in SESDA catalog. And you will, you'll and find the, Dataverse. Uh, and content. the Social Science Humanities Open Cloud, the shop, is a, yeah. so you find it there? You find it there. Okay, yeah. I see, I see, okay. Looks like there's a question in the back, Paula. I know that, uh, to follow up a little bit, Merce, I know that the GDCC and Jim did some work for some folks uh, in uh, France to get the language in the CESDA catalog, so it's easier to search uh, for different language types in there. So we did some work there to try to enhance uh, the CESDA catalog searchability and, and findability there too. So, yes. Yeah. Hi, I'm René Belso from Denmark. So I've been working in the infrastructure business for research infrastructure for about 20 years, and I see the development lately where there is a tendency for more and more universities, at least in our part of the world, that go more and more commercial. So they, they skip the different open source approaches and they go to, with the big providers. So in, in light of that development, why does the Dataverse community, for example, through the, what's it called, your, which we've just become applied for membership, this Global Dataverse Community Consortium, why don't you 10 double the payment membership fees for that and create a company for example, a stock company, and professionalize and hire top, top of the rank uh, computer scientists and follow a roadmap that you, in some democratic way, devise, as opposed to what you're doing now is perfectly fine. Everybody's free to do what they want, and you will have a collaboration, and so on and so on. But in the reality of things, I fear that down the road, it just won't be good enough. Yes, Philippe? 
Yeah, thank you for this uh, feedback. So uh, I think this is, would be a, a good idea in some way or another to, as one of the services that uh, the GDCC, the Global Data Risk Community Consortium or another organization could offer, uh, because I, I also um, have um, noticed this, this trend that you're describing. Uh, for instance, in, in the UK, it's quite common that at least sm smaller institutions, they would just have a tender for for um, uh, for a research uh, data repository or any other services that they need, and then they mostly they would be won by commercial providers. So I think if open source communities, open source software uh, uh, want to survive also in the future, they need to also offer services like um, to to host uh, infrastructure as a service or. or uh, so for 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 organizations that want want to that need the services and, and don't have the the, the, um, the technical know-how to run them on their own either they so I, I think there are two at least two ways either if you don't have the, the know-how you're, uh, you're on your own or the resources then you could uh, collaborate with other uh, similar organizations and create regional or thematic or national uh, consortia like we there are several examples of uh, on, on database based repositories or you could then uh, buy it a service f from a, a, a kind of community like the GDCC or, or other providers. I think there are already commercial pr commercial providers, I think in Italy, that provide service based on the, the data software and, and you have this, the, the, this concept also for other open source uh, um, software. Yeah, I think Philippe is right that this is a good area to try to expand. We've done some work for this. For A good example would be the Institute for Adult Learning in Singapore. They approached GDCC. They didn't have enough resources either on the curation side or the Dataverse system side. And, and uh, the GDCC actually set up their entire system. Uh, they, we trained their, their uh, librarians and their curators, trained their faculty members on how to use Dataverse. And we continually maintain it with an annual maintenance agreement uh, where we maintain their servers, the, those servers over in Singapore for that. And I think further professionalizing that would be really good, especially with some of this new technology, uh, the Dockerized technology and the work that we are seeing moving forward is going to make that so much easier to do as, as well. So I think we got uh, one over here. Yeah, just on that previous point, um, the answer is probably somewhere in the middle, as with many things. So there's an emerging set of principles that I find quite interesting called POSI, uh, Principles of Open Scholarly Infrastructure. So on the one hand, the community needs to be part of the governance and the decision making, and it needs to have guarantees in terms of openness and sustainability and so on. But it can balance that against, let's say, the efficiency that you get from a semi or fully commercialized uh, approach. So I think the, it has merit, but there needs to be checks and balances so that you don't end up with a completely commercial service over which the community doesn't have any control. Yeah, absolutely. Jim? Uh, just, uh, I'll use Slava's line and, and sort of pitch the containerization for a couple of reasons, right? The, as, as you've heard the last couple of days about the re-architecture to make Dataverse more modular, right? One of the one of the downsides of that is that the more modules you have that, that you have to manage manually, the harder it gets, right? So containerization is basically a faster way to do that, but it's also something that I know, you know, a lot of the Dataverse instances are not in their central IT organization and it's hard to go to them and say, can you install and run Dataverse for us? You just have to read all this part of the manual and things. Once it's containerized, they do containers for everybody. And so whether it's a commercial company where I think we can start doing those services or GDCC who can scale better because of containers, it also opens that same door to central IT helping you to manage this stuff because to them, they flip on the switches and it runs and they don't have to deal, right? That it sort of separates out the running the service versus what the service does and what do you do inside of Dataverse. They don't have to care in, in a nice way. So uh, that I think this is all gonna help us get there. At least that's the technical part of this discussion of how do you do the political side of, of service.
Any other questions? I think many libraries will embrace the approach of just give me a container and I'll run it, right? They can pay for the IT cost. It's that support cost, that the labor. It, 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 I think that some will embrace that. Of course, it's new, so some may not, but I think, uh, I, I think it's a good idea. One thing I, 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 I noticed, I was talking with, listening to Slava talk about uh, running in Azure, uh, at, at Odom, we've been running a Dataverse in AWS, and many of other colleagues say, well, what about Azure? What about uh, Google Cloud? And how we expand into other clouds. I think as we containerize, it'll make that easier to expand into other cloud infrastructures as well, and leverage economy of cost. I know that our medical school, for example, has a deal with Google that it's much cheaper, and I'd love to move over there, but I haven't, I'm not quite ready yet but we can save some money with economies of scales if we can move it around in any, any cloud environment we can. I have a question to you about the, the, the different IDs you mentioned in your um, presentation. Um, so are, are they already part of the, the metadata scheme that is shipped with the uh, main distribution or is this something that you customized in the, in the metadata the schema, and if if you if it's if it's if it's customized, I, I think it would be good um, that we could add these kind of um, identifiers to the to the main distribution, and then probably on a, on a local in the local installation, then you could then choose which one of these you would like to display for the depositors. Um, yeah, so our Chris system is really custom because it's quite old. I think it's almost older than I am. Um, so as far as I'm aware, the IDs are semi-native to the Elements software. So um, it's not always shipped with it. And I think, so we added it by adding the TSV, just adding a new field to that citation block. Um, it's probably not <laughs> the best practice. Um, yeah, I, th I think there are some options. Most of the ID options that are relevant are already in the drop-down of the IDs, I believe, where you can choose URN or URL. Um, for us, it was mainly for those publications that aren't public yet, and they oftentimes don't have a persistent identifier that is sort of externally usable, like a URN or whatever, or an ISSN even sometimes. That's why we added it, to really allowed to connect with whatever they want at the moment of publication. I do want to note that I've noticed um, with publications, sadly enough, I think it would work better the other way around, that people would indicate in their registration of their publication what data set is linked, because uh, in our review phases we see that oftentimes data is required to be published before the publication or the journal article gets the DOI. So that's sort of where we trip up there. Um, it's most of the time not in Lirias yet, so we can't actually pull it most of the time. So that is sort of a comment that we've noticed afterwards. But yeah, I, it's, it's a custom ID, I think. I think we have time for another question. Any other questions? All right, if we don't have any more questions, join me in thanking our panelists. Uh, and we have our two videos that we're going to spin up here. Hello everyone, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the team at the University of Stuttgart. My name is Pion Schembera and I'll quickly introduce you to the work integrating MathJax into Dataverse for rendering mathematical formulas. MathJax is a JavaScript library that allows to display mathematical formulas written in MathML or LaTeX in the browser. Users of our Dataverse installation at the University of Stuttgart, the installation is called Darus, required this feature for their descriptive metadata of their research data. So we integrated MathJax in our Dataverse installation by implementing Java, some JavaScript. And in the following minute, I'll give you a very brief live demo on how that works, um, how from a user's pr perspective, 
So maybe I'm a researcher and I'd like to add a new data set and I give it some kind of uh, title and um, the interesting thing comes when we're going for the description. So in the description here, I'm now able to uh, put in some LaTeX code or some MathML code and it will get rendered. So here it's already prepared with some copy and paste. So you see there is a description and some LaTeX formulas. Then I have to choose some more mandatory fields. Um, the others I don't want to fill out. So um, the last mandatory one will be this. And when I click save, in the description I see that the LaTeX formulas get rendered. And you see that's also available for more complex terms like differential e uh, operators and integrals and so on and so forth. So everything around LaTeX can be done here. And yeah, that's it as of now. The work is only accessible on the test system, but it will be generally available to our users on the production system within our next upgrade. And we're happy to share our work with the Dataverse community on request. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello everyone, and welcome to this short heads up about what has happened at Dataverse NO since the last Dataverse community meeting. Dataverse NO is a generic repository for open research data from researchers at Norwegian research institutions. The repository is operated at UIT, the Arctic University of Norway, and thereby the northernmost Dataverse repository in the world. Since it was established in 2017, almost 1400 data sets have been published, divided over 25 sub-collections. In numbers of published data sets, Dataverse NO is Norway's second largest research data repository using DOIs. Last autumn, the University of Oslo and Nofima joined Dataverse NO as partner institutions. This means that we now are 14 partners. Curators at the 14 partner institutions collaborate closely. To better align curation practices, we have monthly curator meetings to discuss data curation. This collaboration served as an inspiration for a project to establish a national curator network across repositories in Norway. The last change we briefly want to mention is the successful cloud migration of Dataverse NO. Our installation is now using Docker container technology and S3 compliant Claudian storage. Please attend our presentation in Lightning Talk session one on Tuesday to learn more. So what are our plans for the future? We want to improve our cloud deployment. We will apply for funding for a major upgrade of the repository and all results will be shared with the Dataverse community. We want to improve domain specific support and we want to implement the care principles in our work. That was it. For more information, please use these addresses. Thank you for watching. So we will have lunch now. Do not forget about the great keynote that we will have from Merced this afternoon. But did you take your clothes, sports clothes, to the football, to the soccer match and to the Pilates? So we will have Pilates and the, the soccer match at uh, half past six. Don't leave the room this afternoon or don't leave the university be be before participating in the group photo. So when we finish at six, we have a group photo and then we run to the sports center to have the soccer match. Argentina, yes, it's there. <laughs> when I talk about soccer, we have Gustavo in there. Okay, this is what we will have also a great uh, session, the demos. The demos, I, people are asking, so the demos will happen outside. You will already see there are like 10 shares like this in front of nine LCDs. So the presenters will be in each session. You need to, in advance, choose three demos that you will 
uh, try to attend because we, they will run in 20 minutes, so the presenters will repeat three times or they don't repeat because the audience will be different, they can ask different things, but this will be the way that we work, okay? Nine demos, each of the participants can join three different demos. You can also join three times the same demo, but it's not great, okay? <laughs> Let's go, the lens is outside.
Uh, welcome to the second part of the day. We are going to start now uh, new sessions. Uh, very briefly, my name is uh, Filipa Pereira. I work as a research data manager in the Foundation for Science and Technology here in Portugal. And I'm very, very pleased to present our special guest, our keynote for today. Uh, she's uh, Merce Crosas. Uh, she's very well known within the scientific community and has greatly contributed also to the Dataverse project. So Mercy is uh, head of computational social science program at BSC, Barcelona Supercomputing Center. Merce is also a former secretary of open government at uh, Generalitat de Catalunya. She's a Catalan researcher specialized in data management and open data. Holds a degree in physics from the University of Barcelona and a doctorate in astrophysics from the University of Rice uh, with pre and post uh, doctorate in Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Uh, she spent a major part of her professional life at Harvard University. So first as an astrophysicist and engineer of the research software at Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and later on as a director of data science and technology at IQSS and chief officer in the management of research data at Harvard University. So today, uh, Merce will focus her presentation uh, in the building of fair data spaces, uh, namely related with federated repositories and also integrated with computing uh, workflows in order to support open science. So Merce, please, your stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation and thanks very, very much to all of you, but to Pedro for the invitation. And uh, it is hard not to be emotional to see how this community is uh, growing, maturing, is still here, strong, <laughs> and with uh, many, as we heard this morning, with many great pres perspectives, right? Uh, changes in architecture, a lot of development from the community, a lot, so many features, so many posters that show us uh, how well the potential of the, uh, having a community that uh, that adds to the core of of the project, right? Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about the, yes the open science now uh, the need for open science. So what does it mean to have a, to provide us open science? Uh, in, in the 21st century, so it's more than just uh, pu open publications, it's open data, it's open code, it's co making um, science more collaborative and, and facilitate the access to, to everything, to computing and to data. Uh, so, and this with the help of fair data spaces. But let me start with a, a, little, a little bit brief in, uh, introduction. Uh, I know, I, uh, thanks for the, the introduction already about uh, my trajectory, but just to connect it to, uh, to the, play, the times that I've worked, <laughs> what type of work I've done related to data and computing along uh, this journey. Uh, so, so, yes, I did started in physics and astrophysics and first in the University of Barcelona uh, and now I'm back at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. But I mean, uh, across the law along the way, right? Uh, so we work uh, first in theoretical model, modeling and com computing uh, for active galactic nuclei, then for circumstellar envelopes uh, as a research software, doing data analysis and computing. Uh, software development, uh, uh, information management systems in biotechs, where I met some some of the people here that, uh, like Alan and Gustavo, for example, were, uh, that, that then became part also of the Dataverse community, and that were our startups in, the, uh, in Boston. Uh, and then, of course, with the Institute for Quantitative Social Sciences and with and general, well, and with Harvard University as a whole, uh, uh, working on open, open data sharing, open uh, source software, open science, data management, data science, data commons, uh, open data, op you know, and finally the open government part too. Uh, so you see a lot of opens here, <laughs> and a lot of data and computing, right? So uh, I guess this talk is, uh, is tries to mix 
all those things together to see what is the, the vision for um, for changing data, uh, among, not only within the research community, but across government, industry, uh, uh, several different various domains, uh, so that we can benefit more in research from data sets across all these different sectors. Uh, when, uh, the, when I went back to, to Barcelona, and, and finally ended up in the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. As you can see, uh, even though this journey seems very long, I just went from 1989 to a place here near the Diagonal in Barcelona that now it takes me actually less than 10 minutes. Uh, here it says 16, but I, I know some shortcuts and I can do 10 minutes to my current work. So after all these years, 30, 30 some years, right of my life, I'm back to where I started <laughs> in some way, but with, with uh, um, interesting experiences uh, in the US and, um, and with um, many different disciplines and fields, right? So also, I just wanted to add, as part of that trajectory, there were a lot of community meetings. <laughs> and and I, I still remember having some of those, uh, well, that I still have some of the talks that we were, gave, uh, we were doing in the beginning of the community meetings and that always ended up with a picture of the previous, uh, previous one. So I found a few pictures that some of you will recognize celebrating uh, the Dataverse community meeting at, at Harvard, right? Um, but now this is uh, the place where I work, uh, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, that if, uh, if you haven't been there, I, well, I now publicly, officially invite you to come and I'll do a tour for you of the place because uh, it's quite a juxtaposition, right? Is a, there is a church, uh, an old church, where uh, they put the, com the supercomputer inside. <laughs> so they chose to have the data, the, this computing center uh, in, a, in, a, well, in a church in the north of Barcelona, next to the University Polytechnic of Barcelona. And when you see it, it's sort of a mix of symbolic. There's always a Gregorian music playing when you go to visit, so you get that feeling that you are in a in a sacred place. But uh, the, but the God is the the computing and the data <laughs> storing these computers. So uh, that that's quite a statement. So so yeah, come and visit it. But uh, well, what is it? What what is the Barcelona Supercomputing Center? How it fits to what I'm going to talk to you today? So uh, one of the main parts about the Barcelona Supercomputing Center is the actual compu computer, the machine, right? The, which is called Mare Nostrum. Since it started in 2004, um, uh, the, to launch the Mare Nostrum one. The Mare Nostrum 5, that is the one coming now, that it's actually expanded so much that it is a new space next to the church for, uh, for uh, the new computer that it's going to be open at the end of the summer. So since then, 2004, 5 uh, to now, 20, uh, 2023, with Mare Nostrum 5, the, the, compu the computing speed has increased 10, 000, by 10,000. So uh, we've now gone to... Uh, with this new computer to, to the, uh, what we would say, the exascale or the or 300 petaflops with this uh, um, peak performance, with this type of um, computing speed, I mean, the flaws being the floating points per, per second, right, the, uh, the, the processing uh, time, the, so the operations per second. And we, with this speed, uh, this will become uh, the the fastest com uh, supercomputer in Europe for some time until the exascale supercomputer in uh, Germany will take. <laughs> I think coming next year will uh, will um, will be the first. Uh, with with this uh, supercomputer also there is much more storage space than before, uh, about 100 petaflops total. And also, also I wanted to point pointed out that uh, this uh, was. There was a help with a consortium with uh, not only Spain, but Portugal and Turkey also to make that happen. And of course, the European Commission, the, um, 
the whole uh, well the, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center is funded by the is a national center so it's funded by by the government of Spain but also by the Generalitat of Catalonia the the government of the Catalan government and the Polytechnic uh, the University of Polytechnic of uh, Catalonia and there are they, it's more than just providing provides that support for supercomputing uh, so these the services for supercomputing that are open to all researchers in Spain and also in Europe through uh, an, uh, an application process. It's free, but uh, you need, but it's a co competitive application. But in, uh, but uh, uh, besides that, what uh, many people don't realize that the Barcelona Supercomputing is also the largest research center in Catalonia. is a, has a, it's a total of more than 800 people working there, um, and it has. Uh, well, life science uh, support for research, right? In life sciences, earth sciences, working on climate change, on what they call uh, uh, an earth digital twin. Uh, for life sciences, they, they're working on the digital twin of the human body or, the, or, the, or the, of humans, right? Uh, to, all the way to um, the, the, the simu doing simulations at the cell level to, to the organs level and be able to do precision medicine. They're also working on computer science uh, research, doing the building the next chip for um, the, the open chip, basically based on risk five. Uh, for building the next Mara Nostrum, the Mara Nostrum uh, 6, but also other supercomputers uh, in, in Europe, right? So this is an open chip, um, the first open uh, processor. Uh, and, and they're providing also engagement with the public and, and a PhD uh, program. But it doesn't have social sciences, so uh, where they they call me to 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 start a whole new program on computational social sciences. I'll pass that quickly because I don't like to see myself in the screen. But I would, I did wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, my vision for that program. So this is just in the last couple of months that I started this program, and and um, uh, we're building the strategic vision for now. And, and the objectives, and started already some collaborations and, and some actual research projects that will be, uh, you sh should get going right after the summer. So first, uh, the um, four uh, goals basically are to, um, to prepare social sciences and humanities to really be able to take advantage of the age of data and AI. Uh, for some of you here that might seem already that you're doing that, so there is no no much need for it, but this is the exception, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, at least uh, uh, within a lot of the European communities, uh, there is a lot of the social science and humanities that are not uh, yet prepared for uh, being able to use uh, so a large um, computing analysis or either uh, AI related or stati uh, statistics or, or large regressions, mul mul uh, multiple variable regressions with a lot of data that can that need to be run in a high performance computing. So this is not uh, the, the too typical. So uh, we we want to help with that, uh, uh, prepare the, the social science for that. Uh, but also this will involve an increased collaboration between social scientists. Um, computer scientists also facilitate how the use of high performance computing, right? The use of, of uh, in this case of the supercomputer, but for any other HPC or research computing that uh, they are often have been built uh, from from years, a couple of decades ago more, with the idea that uh, would run simulations of fluid dynamics, right? And uh, for climate change, very, uh, very essential, or for material uh, um, physics, um, or uh, um, more recently in the in the fields of biomedicine, right, with bioinformatics on, uh, so that there are uh, these researchers um, have already well get the, the experience to run the, the projects in HPC, but it happens less with social science and humanities. So the idea is to facilitate that access uh, to a larger, uh, wider community of scientists 
and researchers. So, uh, and then uh, the last goal is also to apply social science to, uh, uh, to the atrocities poli policy making. And for me, this is, a, is a sort of essential that at the end, when we do social science, humanities, or any science to, for that matter, even when we're uh, talking about astronomy, astrophysics, and so, that it should be relevant to society, it should engage society, it should be, uh, also it should help to give answers to challenge, to, to the challenges that we have in the world, whether uh, it's climate change or health problems or democracy or any, any of those. So connecting those and even more after having been in the government, I think it is an essential part of, uh, of our um, mission uh, in science, right, also. Um, even again, when we do astrophysics, I mean, for the well-being, for our well-being, understanding the universe, uh, the, the, the world around us, uh, also helps us in our knowledge of the world and, 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 our, and having a perspective in things. So I think it, it is important across all the sciences. And, and, and this work or this program will be done with four main uh, areas. One are research projects. We'll start, uh, as I said, more after the summer with three to five Re, uh, large research projects that involve computational social science and uh, also digital humanities. Uh, there might be one in digital humanities for to start. Uh, but as examples of what can be done uh, and the, so, uh, with the use of the supercomputer for these type of projects. But, uh, but then we also, as all of you know, we need to build a community and a reach of the, the, the social science um, researchers to uh, get to, you, to, to be more ready to use computational social sciences. Uh, also, and, and with that I am including um, not only the, the, st the statistical or the or regressions, are obviously linear regressions are essential, uh, again, uh, with many large data sets or so, but also machine learning, uh, text analysis, um, the, the simulations like agent-based simulations of, so, of social behavior that are now starting to, to take place also in, in some of the research communities. So all those type of um, uh, research that will a community uh, of researchers that do this work. Then also to provide an education and training to, to uh, change or to provide at least the, the option in, within social science and humanities to do more data science, to do more computational work. And also the, the last part, which I'll focus more on the tools and services, and this is, um, well, it would include the part about creating a data space for social science data. So that includes not only uh, research data, but uh, data from industry and data from government that can be used. Um, for research, for uh, then also uh, providing open workflows and user-friendly interfaces so the, that integrate with this high-performance uh, computing, with, in this case with the supercomputer at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, but that could be reusable in others. Uh, and of course, uh, all this probably is very familiar to all of you, especially uh, the NIQSS that we did a lot of that, sa that same, but uh, also provide these data science and curation services uh, within, uh, well, for the, the Spanish community. Um, and, if, and if needed, it could be collaborated and extended to others. So uh, a couple of words about what, uh, how we see open science now, uh, I've talked that, in, in previous talks sometimes that the importance of, uh, of that open science should be supporting what science is now, right? How, how science is done now and science is increasingly more collaborative, right? Uh, larger groups, uh, larger teams across disciplines. Uh, um, very important the cross-disciplinary part, uh, show you a little bit more about that. It's also increasingly more automated, right? There are more uh, uh, processes that can be uh, either with AI tools or, or with just our automated tools, computational tools can be uh, done uh, better and quicker, more efficiently. It also needs to be responsible towards data, right? I mean, and in Europe we have the GDPR, but uh, but even without the regulation, uh, we we know that there is sensible data that, that we want to do research with, but we need to, um, to have the uh, provide tools that uh, 
pro, uh, that uh, well don't don't allow don't don't make it easy or or that provide guarantees even right to to re uh, identify sensible data sets. Uh, also, it has to be ethically, I mean, responsible in the sense of ethically. Um, the well sound and it has to be like I said also or it is becoming increasingly relevant to society even more when we uh, face uh, big global challenges that then uh, that like we did with the uh, the, pande the pandemic or, or we are doing we have now is climate change so those are important parts of what open science needs to help and I'm uh, well here what, uh, what I'll talk about and I'm proposing is that this can can be done with these fair data spaces right integrated with computing but let's talk a little bit about data uh, data spaces or in general data infrastructures so there are there's been a lot of talk since at least i've been working on this in this space of uh, data management data sharing about different types of data infrastructures are the data repositories like we all uh, know talk about here here's an example of the the one pro, uh, supported by the csuc the the, uh, the uh, sounds sounds uh, strange saying it in English, right? <laughs> yes, the 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 uh, but it, but it, but it's the Sesuk, the right that uh, that supports it behind, but that it has a the um, uh, a data birds here collection for every university research center. Uh, so that is an example of the repositories, like uh, like all of all, uh, many of the ones that we've talked about today, and research data portals. Uh, one of the definitions that they, you can make more. I could I, I could actually go and ask all of you, each one of you, how would you define a data repository? It might come with a slightly different definition, but uh, but in this case we're talking about well a, a, an application that that will support the, the collection, the storage. It will handle data, right? It will be able, uh, allowed to share that data and support metadata uh, and long-term access to the data. I don't, I'm not saying now archival preservation because are big words, but uh, but uh, obviously when it can support that as a data archive, it's even better uh, with preservation. But I'm talking about long-term access as as we talk about fair with fair data. So um, usually you have the you find the data uh, store or accessible through data across data sets, data files basically that. Uh, you can access easily downloaded in general. Uh, the data portal, though, is this website that makes them the data. Well, the underlying data repositories or, or data um, or databases, right, but easily available to researchers. But then we also talk about data commons and data lakes uh, to make it even more confusing. So, uh, based on uh, Robert Grossman's uh, article uh, work. Uh, on data commons, here are a couple of the definitions. Uh, Grossman was uh, one of the co-PIs with a, a large collaboration or consortium we did with the NIH data commons. That was also one of the co-PIs uh, for for this to provide a data data commons for NIH. So in this case, it defines data commons as the co-location of data and computing infrastructure and commonly used software services, tools, and application for managing, integrating, analyzing, and sharing data that are exposed through APIs to create an interoperable resources. So that, uh, that is some of the work that, uh, that uh, we, can, we heard has been done at Harvard with the data commons. The data lake, uh, I guess the big difference is that the, the data are not a store as, as a structured data sets or, or in a structured data, relational database. Uh, uh, they are objects, it, uh, it doesn't have um, um, a data model behind. Uh, but uh, but uh, you still have the, the global IDs, and you can still um, uh, get infer well some uh, explore it or, infer, um, or uh, infer predictions and so from from the data lake um, if you uh, well through the through the API uh, to uh, to access all the the, the sum of those data sets. 
So data spaces, so Europe started to talk about data spaces also a little bit ago. Uh, they were, I, I've heard them in two different communities, in the research community and the industry community within Europe for the industry. There is a project called Gaia-X uh, that, uh, that, pl that plans to support this exchange of data. I mean, this is, uh, goes along with what a, what a new uh, re um, a new law from uh, the European uh, Commission from from for Europe uh, for you that it's on that, that that now it's a proposed data act that it's going to come in place relatively soon although there's still some discussions about some parts of the data act but the data act uh, as opposed to as complementary to the GDPR right it it provides. Uh, more a support for a data economy, for the marketplace of data sets, where uh, not only uh, research, uh, well, science and so share data, but also um, industry businesses can share data in a free, open way whenever possible. This is to, to be seen about the, the various levels, but the idea is to be very open. So shares data also to, uh, uh, to because um, with the idea that the economy of data will help to provide solutions, uh, tools, uh, new, uh, if you have more data available about all the, the transports, about communication, about how people move, you can make, build better, uh, better solutions for a city, right? For transfer of a city as, a, as an example, and in many, many other examples. There are some related to tourism. If you share data about tourism, you can provide better services. So that's one aspect of data, these data spaces, but there is another aspect of data spaces uh, uh, within Europe with the European of a science cloud, and that's before already Slava was talking about the social science and the humanities open cloud. Uh, but uh, within these context also, uh, there is the talk about fair data spaces. Uh, the Helmholtz Metadata Collaboration has have provided this, uh, this definition of data spaces. The fair data space is a decentralized infrastructure for trustworthy data sharing and exchanging data ecosystems based on commonly agreed principles. So it is, uh, it's quite a broad definition, right? Could, we could include a lot of the things. Uh, and interpret in different ways how to implement it. So here, how how um, uh, suggesting to to implement it. So with uh, these fair data spaces, in this case now, uh, we're bringing the fair to this concept of uh, of sharing data across the various sectors uh, based on the fair data principles. Uh, but we we first. Think of a, a simplified way of implementing the, the principles, uh, the fair principles for findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable data uh, in data spaces. So uh, the, for the, the identified, uh, identifiers are provided by repositories. So we provide a DOI. I'm simplifying again. I know there could be other type of global persistent identifiers, but the DOIs, uh, and as long as it's per data set, uh, is the sort of the minimal support, and so it could be perversions of file op options. Then there is a, a layer of uh, levels to to the to to access the data, right? Uh, to make it very explicit how you can access the data with data use agreements, or with licenses, or with waivers like uh, CC zero, right? And whenever possible, make it open. Uh, so this uh, was a simplified version of data tax. So I'll, mention, I'll show it in a little bit. There could not be the diverse community without saying data tax. Uh, I think that if we've talked about it every time, although it goes slowly in parallel, um, I get some progress about uh, well uh, integrating with the data tax system. But uh, then the um, the the other part is the semantics, the the semantic artifacts, right? The the part that is more complex or that is harder for just the repositories to support uh, the, for the fair, right? Is the all the the the, the metadata, but not uh, not only the 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 standard metadata or the descriptive metadata, right? And that you said, but all the uh, the vocabularies, the, the data dictionaries, the control vocabularies, that to be um, 
uh, really interoperable across uh, domains, across data sets, so that you could easily merge one data set with another to, uh, to create or, or aggregate the data sets to create a new resource, a new data set that where you could do new research from. Uh, and, and that's always uh, the challenge and it is the one that it is hard uh, to provide an, um, just that the repository provides by default to the level to be able to support all the possible vocabularies and, and taxonomies and also that there has to be an input of the subject expertise to, uh, uh, to, to when they provide the data set to the, to this, to the repository. So uh, here, the, the part I'm suggesting that it's already been mentioned here in, the, in some of the presentations is uh, more AI-assisted uh, semantics artifacts for getting to FAIR. Uh, and as we know, for FAIR, it's not a, it's not, it doesn't mean that uh, you have achieved that the FAIR principles is sort of a, a constant improvement, a process, or uh, like the Helmholtz uh, uh, I mean, organizations calls it uh, um, a road to FAIR. You have a road to go and you, uh, to get there step by step. So as I said, uh, the data tags are often present in, this, in these meetings. Um, here, uh, simplify sort of what I think could be a simplified version, but the, the, what the, the important message here is not so much data tags themselves, but, but the fact that uh, uh, we do need levels of access to data, right? Uh, that open data whenever possible uh, is great. Dataverse supports those uh, levels of access, but to make them a little, um, more, uh, standardize them more, or make them harmonize them more across repositories and across, uh, well, in this case, communities of uh, or sectors, right? If we're going to include data from industry, data from research, data from government, what kind of agreement we have about how we share that data. Uh, so uh, we go from blue from uh, open licenses to to have to access with registration to have a data use agreement. So when we have sensitive data, then we go with a signed use agreement. But uh, when we have red, we can, we need a data enclave. In the sense that uh, what uh, what that means is that you have to uh, uh, work on the data in in the where the data resides. You can never you're not allowed to download it. Right, uh, and I think Crimson is like that data set cannot be part of the data space in this case. So if we agreed in this type of levels would facilitate this exchange of data across, uh, across sectors. Uh, and, and we want to do that with fair assessment. There is uh, some of you uh, already know that with the welfare, there is this cross domain interoperability framework and guidelines. Uh, that help with fair assessment. This, uh, uh, well, Codata, RDA, and so are are, are part of that. Uh, here's a, a link to learn more about this. There, are, there the, this a couple year project is in the is starting the second year. Uh, there's been also some some workshops, some more meetings lately about uh, for the semantic artifacts, the importance of mat mapping, mapping some metadata schemas with other metadata schemas to, to make those data, the, the data sets uh, more interoperable. Uh, and from and to me, this again is the probably the hardest part of of fair this interoperability uh, that at the end helps you with the reuse of the data. Uh, and, and that will help with this harmonizing merging data sets uh, across disciplines, across uh, domain, right, and create more collaboration across the, the disciplines. Also, uh, will we'll help to not only uh, to, to provide this merging or, the, or this connection across data, data sets across uh, communities, but also across different steps of the life cycle uh, and, and having also these aggregated data sets as a researchable resource, right? So within, um, for the, uh, respect, with respect to this mapping, there is a, also a repository, uh, with a, well, repository or catalog or so, where you can share your semantic mappings uh, and with some metadata to see how you build uh, from how, how you do across walks from one schema to another. 
but also there is uh, some, well, as part of that workshop, there was a, from data side, Christian Garza also presented uh, the, some playing, I wouldn't say that this is yet anything working, but it's more exploration and playing with, uh, with generative AI, right, in this case, with ChatGPT, but, uh, but I would imagine doing that with something much more uh, specific and more uh, more reliable, where you, uh, you could um, help, well, it, would, it could help you map uh, metadata schemas, right, from one domain to another. So there is a lot of tedious work that could, uh, uh, you might not do a perfect job, but, uh, but it could be uh, some of the tedious work that could be done uh, by, by LLMs. Uh, there is also we talk we've heard uh, today about the knowledge graphs. So uh, using AI for knowledge graphs, uh, I also recommend uh, this. This is well as part of a seminar. There is this paper uh, with Paul Groth and others uh, where it talks also about how building those knowledge graphs um, with the help of AI tools. So then, uh, well, we have these fair data spaces that, that with the help of some. Some tools uh, we can well we can make the metadata layer much more uh, much stronger. Which, uh, generate new metadata, uh, do mapping across metadata schemas, and so. But then we need that part of integrating with computing. So uh, to, to to talk about that, I wanted to introduce uh, well some of you in case you don't uh, you might not know it. Uh, the this study that uh, the it was published in 2022, but it was organized by the National Academies of Science and Engineering and Medicine uh, on automated research workflows for accelerated discovery, scientific discovery, right? So uh, as part, this is something I was doing in parallel between Harvard and government, the government, Catalan government. So uh, for a couple of years, they were, uh, uh, they was uh, contributed to this committee. Um, although uh, at some point I just couldn't contribute that much, but that study came out and, and there are some interesting uh, co uh, conclusions. So the, uh, here, the, well, it describes first what, is these what are these automated workflows, right, for that help scientific discovery. If, if we think of, uh, of science as this, uh, this iterative loop from model to data, um, data to model, right, uh, from from data we're learning about the model, when we have a model of, uh, uh, well, in some cases is a physical model of like uh, this fluid din dynamics or so. Uh, so you would take that uh, that model, you get data to to validate the model, but then um, you, could, uh, you can also use uh, the additional data helps you to improve the model. In some cases that, uh, that model is a, is a regression, is a prediction, right? Some other predictive model about, about uh, in economics or so. So it could be in any field, but you have that constant loop. So how do we uh, do some automation? Not, not a full automation, but some parts of that loop we help automate. So uh, the, the, these research processes exist, right? And they can take, it's not a, a always a smooth, but uh, more, uh, most of the um, many cases it goes from this from model to data data to model so uh, these uh, automated research workflows help, help integrate the computation the laboratory automation in some cases and tools from AI so that you can perform those tasks in a more efficient way but not only because uh, because it it has these um, uh, well accelerating the, the the scientific discovery but also for for better uh, better science in the sense that uh, you can make them you can uh, make those processes more repeatable right more reproducible like uh, many of you know the importance of that but as we as we're building uh, these tools that help us automate this, we can do it in a way that that we that are reusable, uh, that can uh, replicate it over and over, and it helps uh, improve, uh, help being improved and uh, create a more reliable, better science at the same time that accelerating it when when needed, uh, and and the, this is part of what 
this uh, study from the National Academy of Sciences uh, focused on and uh, provided uh, examples from the community that were uh, brought in from material sciences, right? In, in some cases, would, uh, uh, you can go from, uh, I mean, a lot, uh, some, sometimes it's just having the same data, but you use the tools, the automated tools, to, to get uh, more, uh, more science out of the same data. Uh, in some cases here, it can, the time required for synthesis and testing of some materials, right, from nine months to five days. In particle physics, also to the the same much uh, experiments could uh, could achieve a much higher sensitivity. Uh, in drug discovery, yeah, so we've seen that over and over with some of these AI tools that have helped. Uh, for ex and in this example, is a that allows to identify 57% of active compounds, right, performing 2.5% uh, of all the, the experiments, compared to previous to using these tools, which uh, was a 20%. Uh, so in astronomy, the same, how uh, yeah, uh, helps or, or uh, the automation of, of the telescopes help to select the, the target of what you're gonna be observing. Um, and in digital humanities also. So compiling la large, very large sets of information uh, so that in this case from languages to see really the, the over the centuries from uh, historical texts and so forth. In this case, uh, OCR is also involved and so, but, uh, but then um, to see how the, uh, the evolution of language, but also the, uh, at some point, it, it also reflects on the evolution of, the, of human thought. So for, for doing these uh, automated workflows and these computational data workflows, we need a uh, multidisciplinary team science, uh, a new term, team science, well, new term, as maybe some of you know, but uh, was relatively new for, for me when I uh, learned it from this study that we did. Uh, where are the, uh, you have, in, in this case, you might not be able to read it, so I'll read it for you. They have domain scientists, right? In some cases, uh, in, in Dubai medicine, you might have biologists, right? Uh, data scientists, computational scientists, data engineers, software developers, visualization experts, and data curators. And, and these are the uh, various roles that help with this automated uh, research workflow. Uh, and at the end, the study recommendations were uh, to, for these uh, automated research workflows in order to provide, uh, well, facilitate openness and reproducibility and transparency in, re in research, in order to uh, incorporate also uh, principles of responsible AI, uh, given that a lot of the AI tools are used uh, for this type of um, automated workflows. Uh, Prioritize also the reusability and sustainability um, uh, be uh, driven and controlled by the research community. So um, all, of, all of this, I mean, this, uh, again, can go, you can get that, that study is, uh, is quite a large, uh, well, 70 or, or 100 pages, uh, but, uh, but there is quite a little bit of information about various examples for uh, research workflows. So how do we take this and all the, the other, um, the previous, uh, well, description of fair data spaces, right? And, and build, uh, in this case, with the new program with the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, what, what kind of proposal we do to, to create this fair data space integrated with computing. So for one, one thing is that to build a data space, fair data space where we have a federation of data repositories and, uh, with, within the social science and humanities, but uh, with these, Access, well, the simplify uh, levels of access, right? Using with what I described about the simplified data tax uh, to integrate with the supercomputing, with high performance computing uh, by using also these computational workflows and, also, and, and user friendly interfaces. Uh, yeah, and then to have this layer of exploring or at least trying to, to, to develop these tools for AI to assist with this generation and the harmonization of metadata. So uh, within the Barcelona supercomputing, there, are some, there is some work already uh, by, um, sorry, by, um, 
Uh, now I don't. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, Rosa Badia, Rosa Badia is the person that leads these efforts. I, I was trying to find all the all the contributors, but Rosa uh, is a computer scientist that leads these efforts on, on workflows, computational workflows that are that integrate with the supercomputing. Uh, there is a, a library in Python for that, and uh, we started the, the conversations about how we could integrate that with data sets in repository uh, in data repositories such in Dataverse. Um, and extend the workflows, the support for workflows for uh, projects that are, or research projects that are relevant to social sciences and humanities. And, and what about Dataverse in all these pictures? So uh, when we take this fair data space integrated with computing, uh, as here, a very super simplified ver um, picture of it or visualization of it is that we have this layer of uh, AI-assisted metadata generation, right, and harmonization. We have these data computational workflows, these automated workflows that uh, integrate directly, uh, that help integrate uh, or, or to have the code to optimize uh, any of the, uh, whether they are our libraries for some statistical modeling, uh, statistical analysis, or um, Python libraries for ML, uh, and some text analysis for LLM, uh, LLM so that, that we have that integrated with the, with a supercomputer, with a high-performance computing resource, right? It's an optimized for running parallel like that, so the workflows provide that layer. Um, and then we have, uh, the data comes from the those uh, from the data repositories, and in this case, what uh, well powered by by Dataverse, but uh, in this case, uh, suggesting here that the, the, the federation of those repositories includes or, or this data space includes the data from industry and government as well. So basically, with that, we can. Im Increase the community by 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 a hundred if we start adding uh, open government data uh, uh, and also data from businesses or industry where they want to share that data for research. Uh, so, with all that, I I have a conclusions about about this work and. If, if we do, if the Dataverse community really supports all all these type of data spaces, I think we might need much larger uh, venues. For, but uh, we'll, we'll see um, if uh, if there can be this transformation, or at least even if if some industry would be part of it and some government would be part of it, it would be interesting pilot. So. Uh, the, the, but as conclusions, right, uh, uh, that we have the supercomputing centers that need data is very, is very difficult now. Uh, we're not at the time of just simulations that were done uh, a couple dec decades ago when uh, you basically had a, a physics simulation, for example, where um, the amount of data needed were, was relatively uh, small. Now a lot of the supercomputing centers are there to support very large uh, uh, many times AI-based uh, analysis that require a lot of data, so they need the data. The data centers need the computing. I mean, it's, it's hard to infer anything from data as you grow the data center if you don't need the computing. So it's about, um, the project is about bringing them together. When we have, uh, if we provide a, a federation of data repositories, the, the the long tail of data can live in the repository, but the large data sets need to be close to the computing, right? Uh, and and in the, you, don't want, you want to avoid the latency uh, about transferring data. And in, the, and in this case, uh, then we need to support like this uh, a federated data, sp uh, data space where uh, you have those two choices, uh, the small data sets that you can download and you can use with some of computational workflows to directly, well, to, to run in, um, in HPC uh, if, if needed, but also you could just find the meta, through the metadata, find the, the data resource that lives in the, in the supercomputing center, in the, oh, in the uh, HPC research computing center, and from and there be able to do that, uh, that computing um, without the need of transferring the data. Uh, we uh, the second point is about these automated workflows that can facilitate this connection between the data repositories and the computing. 
Uh, the the other the third point is that uh, AI can fa facilitate the connection across data sets for harmonizing um, by harmonizing their metadata, the metadata of the data sets, and create new metadata in some way. Uh, also, that we know that well, research can benefit also from working more closely with data from industry and, and government. I mean, the same way that government can benefit from results from research, right? And the same for industry. So, uh, so we here to data repositories now can power powered by the dataverse can support these uh, fair data spaces, right? Where uh, data from not only research but industry. Uh, government and government can exchange um, fair data sets. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mercy. It was an excellent presentation, as we Thank were you. expecting. Uh, we still have some minutes uh, to uh, ask the audience if there are any questions to be raised. Okay. <laughs> My friends. <laughs> And you have my contact. Uh, oh, don't bombard me, but, uh, but, <laughs> but please, uh, not really seriously, write to me. Uh, this is about build, building a, a whole new project in, in Spain, and we want it to grow. So I have a question uh, about semantic enrichment. So if you have uh, your data set metadata uh, stored in Dataverse, and you will do semantic enrichment, obviously it will be another UI, or you see it somehow different? Another U UI, you're saying? UI or some kind of persistent identifier? Ah, the UI. Uh, sorry, sorry. Okay. So another UI for the metadata artif art. If it will be enriched with something like ChatGPT, you you'll obviously will get a lot of new relationships. Right. Predicted by AI. So, so I, I, I think that only, the, I mean, I haven't started through here. There are a lot of things that are preliminary, our thoughts about that we're going to explore, and we and I know some of them have started to started to explore, but uh, I, I think that's only important. I mean, the, the DOI should, you should only give at the point that you you create a new uh, mm, a new aggregated resource that you know it's useful. I, I I think when you're exploring and finding a lot of relationships. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that that would be, it's not something that you, you're ready to publish or make it reusable. So at the point that you say, I, I want, this is a, my fair digital object in some, in some way, then you give it a, a DOI. Okay, so it will be a new one. Yes, I, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm thinking. But uh, again, there is uh, the criteria about what is that is really mm -hmm. useful to uh, the community. It, it's a difficult one, right? But, but it doesn't mean that anything that it keeps that you would find would be the case. I mean, this is a, as a tool for exploration of what kind of relationships you can, you can get. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, just about uh, two slides earlier, when you start to, to have your picture on uh, fair data space, okay, here. Uh, I have one concern with respect to reproducibility in research. Yes. And when I think to such construction, because uh, in the COVID-19 museum, in the now museum, we have thought to exactly the same type of construction, mm -hmm. where you have computational resources close to the data, mm -hmm. and uh, where you have aggregation of collections. And if you think in terms of aggregation of collection, arrive a problem, is that some collection can arrive try to produce fake news mm. and disappear. Uh, yeah. Okay? Yeah. You have so one guy like this who was uh, in US for four years at, uh, at the White House or something like that. <laughs> so yeah. now the question is here, how you ensure that you have reproducibility in such system where collection of data can appear and disappear. This yeah. is, I can propose right. you a solution, but okay, okay. This, right, right, right. this is just to open the discussion. Right, right, right. And I, and I understand that it could be that case that it's a streaming data that might be disappearing. On the, on, on the other hand, I think that there are some snapshots you can take of what, I mean, again, we're, we're 
uh, still I think that we're supporting science and research and um, even if you use some data that might be might disappear there would be the snapshot of that data set that you use that that should be in the repository right um, is that a or yeah, the, I, I think that we in this type of workflow we should ensure that the code which has been used on this machine and the output of the computation remains also stored, not provide, provide to the user, but also stored in the system. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, for the, uh, in, when really we worked on this, uh, this study for the, get that others, many others contributed, right? But it was also that there was a, the, the output was uh, the end, well, stored also, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so um, I think it's, it's encouraging that we have this, let's say, meta-level organization of the community and developing the frameworks to improve uh, FAIR in broad terms. But I'm also, from a practical level and uh, years in the trenches as both a user and provider of data, for me, there are still, as it were, potholes in the road. And those potholes are the fact that uh, especially data is not born fair. We are not doing closely enough, in my view, to making sure that data is created already interoperable and reusable uh, in, okay. in many respects. Yep. And that is the big, uh, that's the part of the iceberg yeah. under the water because that's where the effort lies when people want to reuse data is to try and integrate data. Right, right. No, that's very... All kinds of different sources. I agree. And that's where I put a, a big emphasis about the integration of data as, a, to me, the most useful part about FAIR, right? Uh, well, more useful or the more, more complex also, the more difficult to achieve. Uh, and, and as I said, also, you never achieve it completely, you know. But, but I'm also trying to be more practical. So, so yeah, um, yeah. You, you, if you put a lot of, uh, I mean, if we were all uh, were clones of John Crafty and Tilmai and Sonia, whatever, and uh, know about a lot of our data curation and create perfect data sets with everything that, uh, so that interoperable, uh, uh, well, it's very interoperable. Um, we uh, we wouldn't need additional tools at the end of the and other parts of the life cycle, but not all the data is created like like that. And I think that we can use uh, uh, other tools along the way to help us find the the better data, the the ways to connect that data to to make it to merge it. You might find a variable uh, in one data set that uh, that it seems to be similar to the variable in that meta, other meta, uh, data set, uh, and if that assists you to connect it and say. Hey, merging these data set that I don't know, this government put uh, here that followed a different standard or not a standard at all, follow their own uh, diction control work, their own dictionary, right? Data dictionary. And and, mer and finding this other one has uh, something seems to be similar. Let's uh, let's see if we can merge those. So I, I, I just think that, uh, that um, well, we could we can do both things. That one thing doesn't uh, remove the other. We can uh, train or, or, or help people to create better data, high quality data, define uh, variables following a, a standard, following a, co a community standard, right? Uh, but even in this case, from community to community, that will change and it will not always be perfect. So I think the assistance of tools to to help us that along the way. Uh, I, I mean, build, building, I mean, we were talking about marketplaces, right? Before Stefano talked about marketplace uh, uh, for, the, for the dataverse, but the marketplace of tools for metadata, the semantic artifacts, I think, could be interesting just to improve how, how the, the quality of the data sets, again, to do better, to do an analysis, to do from uh, predictive or causal inference, right? Or whatever. Whatever we we want, or some exploration. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. I, just following on that in the potholes, I think one of the things that thinking about this is a workflow and getting into the active research phase gives you a way to pave over that because but we used to go around to researchers and talk to them and they say, well, you know, I have no time to put on the data set, you know, what trial this was and what data it's on. Right. I just have time to put it in the file system where I put folder slash date slash trial slash what. All that data is there. So if you start automating this part, A, a you can pick it up and AI is going to help with that. But B, you can get rid of the, the work they're doing now to manually curate it for their own purposes if it's in a repository where they can get it back while they're still doing the research, right? You, you can benefit them before the publication stage. So we, we, exactly. started, yeah. we started talking about active and social curation of right. the, the original person and then the community around the data. They're having to do this work. They just don't like doing it again for your purposes and the formal vocabulary. And once you get this workflow idea in your head, you realize you're opening up lots of possibilities to kind of capture it for them with that and take the work away and give them the benefit in other stages of research. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's great. Back there, Paul. <clears throat> Thank you, Marce, for this very nice talk. So we are not ready to, to really announce this, but we are working exactly in the same direction. So I'm very glad that you gave a framework for, for this. And I, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and but the po my point is uh, how to make it happen in terms of uh, what just Jim said. And the idea is that if we give something back to the uploader of the data, like, okay, you're uploading your data, and you give me this additional information, this additional curation information, maybe aided by LLMs or some other automatic tools, which helps you to do this. And then I give you back the opportunity to link your data to any other types of data existing in Dataverse. And so you enrich your data, and that's why, I mean, most of the researchers just want to enrich their data to make right. better analysis. So it's a matter of incentivize in a, in a proper way and even socialize a bit this activity, which mm -hmm. may that's make this neat. happen. So this is what I'm thinking and working with, with Steve and the other in Dataverse. We are mm -hmm. not ready to announce it, but this is something we are that's doing. really neat. So that's very neat. I yeah. really like your talk. That's, that's, uh, that's great. I'm very excited about it, really. Uh, that would be, I can see it would be very useful, but uh, we'll talk more hopefully soon. <laughs> Hi, Mercy. Thank you for your talk. Um, I would like to, to understand a little bit more about the tags, the license tags that you mentioned, color tags related uh, to the yeah. license. Mm -hmm. Is it in the repository level or in the portal level that yeah. you are going to implement these? Right. That's a, it's a good question because it could be also in the, in the data space, uh, the way to exchange. But I think that the repository needs needs to provide a, at least the support, which I think Dataverse is not that far from it, but it's about uh, about uh, standardizing it a little bit more, maybe more structured, that those are the levels that exist and that you that make it easier to see these are the data sets that have that level. This is, I mean, it, it, it's important for finding it and understanding that, that what data sets have are in one level, right? But also for if you're a researcher or if we involve people that are in other sectors or uh, outside academia to understand how do I exchange my data? How do I share or I, I'm part of that marketplace or there's a uh, data economy, right, in, in a data space? So that, in that case, I think having that uh, as a standardized as possible and a structure and with templates uh, for data use agreements. And so it, it is essential because it, otherwise it takes forever to make any agreement or to, to figure out how will I make that data available to you for research, right? So, so I, I think there is one part that the Dataverse should support, and again, it's almost, the, I mean, it has the functionality, it's about structuring it in a, in a way that you can tag it, you, you know that it, in what level it is. And then there is a, another layer that is more maybe uh, an, political and ministerial, I don't know how to say it, but about, or legal, right? That it's about how, if you're this repository and I'm this repository, or I'm these different providers, what, what kind of, um, what agreements I'm 
I, w I would like to standardize so to make that a change as easy as possible and you don't need to start from scratch every time. And again, I think that all of us are doing that in some way, but I, I'm yeah. proposing to do it more, in a more coordinated way, uh, on a standard, uh, standard way so that, uh, that is smoother. Easy. More pedagogical. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and another question is, um, is this project considering uh, data that was uh, stored in repositories outside Spain, for example? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, we, wa we wanna, start with uh, well, data from the research community in social science and humanities within uh, the universities around, well, that, that are for more closely with the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, but the idea is to be very global, but of course uh, uh, with Europe very much, because again, the BSc is, provides support to scientists in all Europe, right? But it's now also making agreements across uh, 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 beyond Europe too, so, yes. Okay, thank you. Just uh, with respect to this slide, there is one application which could be interested uh, here. It's annotation. If you allow public annotation now of your data, mm -hmm. meaning anyone can make annotation on your data, then the people who are coming after could want to see only part of the annotation, for example, coming from professor, coming from researcher, coming from industry, or whether not coming from the general public, or in the reverse direction, coming from the general public, but not from this type or this type of people. Mm -hmm. And in this spirit, you are, it's not sensitive data, no non-sensitive data, it's in between, mm -hmm. and you would like to provide access in a different way to your annotation, depending the demand of the people. I see. I, I, the name of the tool is annotation. This is the, the thing is to make a, to leave the opportunity to have annotation from made by the others, public by directly on your on your data. Okay, I, I need to think about how to connect those two things. Yeah, but I, it's I, I interesting. Will bring you, yeah. Okay, okay, we'll <laughs> talk about that. Yes, that's good. Okay, we still have two minutes. Is there anyone else that would like? Yeah, sure. Yeah, maybe just a, another question. Um, there's a slide where you say that FAIR guarantees reproducibility. And I'm not sure... FAIR that guarantees reproducibility? Mm, yeah, I'm I, not I don't, sure I, that I that's the case. I, I, it seems strange that I would say that yeah. because I'm very careful about saying <laughs> guarantee <laughs> something for, <laughs> but uh, what, leads, what would it be? <laughs> or that it leads to, repro uh, it, I, su I suppose it ah, supports maybe, reproducibility. Maybe that, uh, that uh, yeah. with the study recommendations uh, here? Yeah, somewhere there. But I mean, I, obviously we agree that it is, uh, it's necessary for reproducibility, but probably not uh, sufficient for reproducibility. Yeah, 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 yes. Um, um, I, I don't know what, uh, you, if I find it, uh, I yeah. would correct it because I, I, I almost would say that nothing guarantees uh, nothing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's very hard that I would say that. Yeah. Very few things are guaranteed for something else, but uh, some of them. <laughs> um, but not in this case, yeah, you don't know, that's what I'm worried about. Um, well, I guess uh, if there are no more questions. I know that we will think, be the, yes. uh, talking. I would like I would to, to thank again, Merci, and uh, I would ask another round of applause. So just before coming to the demo sessions, we are just going to watch two more videos.
Welcome to Redap, repository de dados de pesquisa da Embrapa, the research data repository of the Brazilian Agricultural Research Corporation. We are more than 8,000 employees working in 43 research centers spread along the Brazilian territory and seven central units in Brazil. Redapi was launched in April 2022 in accordance with our data governance policy, which also established data management plans as an important activity in the life in the data life cycle. All the data sets published at Redapi are accompanied by a CC by NC license and go through a digital creation process. We are at embrapa.br slash Redap. In one year, we had 199 data sets published and there are more coming in the near future as we have now 60 data sets under the revision process and we have also 52 drafts. Please visit us at embrapa.br slash redar. Obrigada. Thank you very much. We'll start now. Second hello, session, hello. André. Copia. So now we will start another session, the demo session, a more interactive session. Um, I think I can use this mic. Oh, okay. Um, so in this session, we'll have two distinct moments. Okay. First, we will have here in, in the, on this room a two minutes presentation of each demonstration. Okay. So I will invite the author that will present the demo to be to be here to present in two minutes using this slide deck uh, and then in second part all of us go outside to the central hall in which we will find a specific place identified for each demo we will have we have already a lcd to be used by the presenter okay to plug in their laptop and then start the demonstration this demonstration will be for three times, okay? So each participant can attend at least three demonstrations, okay? This is the reason we are repeating three times, so you, ca you can uh, benefit at least for three presentations. Each demo, the, the place, <laughs> this is one of the nine places, you will find this LCD uh, and, and, and uh, identification on this, on this paper. So all the demos are um, identified with number and title, so you can choose which demo uh, you would like to, to attend, okay? Any doubts? All clear? Okay. So during the, the presentation, during the 20 minutes, I will uh, measure the time, and once the 20 minutes are um, I've reached, I will clap my hands, also my colleagues, and we need to, to switch. Only the presenters will maintain on place, and uh, the, the participants will choose another, another demonstration, okay? So, now we can start with the two minutes presentation. And the first one is the integration dashboard, pulling data from data management system. Hi, so yeah, I'm not Eric, but Eric will be doing the demo. <laughs> I'm just a talking head to make sure that I stay under uh, two minutes. So my colleagues and I, we created a dashboard to simplify the import of data from external data management systems by using this dashboard. Um, so basically, we all know that there are a bunch of systems out there to use during your active data phase, but how do we actually easily get the data from those systems into Dataverse? 
That's exactly what we did with the dashboard. So it's in a simple way to pull data from these existing systems. We initially tried to improve some of the integrations that were already in place, like in OSF, but really encountered that sometimes it was quite difficult to um, talk to the people behind those systems and get the plugins working again if they had been neglected over time. So what we did instead was set up a pool. So we have whatever active data system you have and Dataverse and the integration dashboard which basically finds and selects the data from the source, finds what's already in your data set, or if you create a new data set, nothing, uh, and compare it to each other. And then um, you select what you want to do with what data, and then it gets transferred. My colleague Eric will show more on this dashboard. Um, and I think the next one is also ours. Yes, I'm also not Ersku. <laughs> So that's my other colleague. He has been working on the review dashboard to keep track of reviews and reviewers. So um, we set this up because we have a curation phase at our Dataverse, and we really notice that it can sometimes be quite time consuming, and some tasks are repeated multiple times and are exactly the same. So what we've done is uh, what it used to be. We've added a layer onto it um, so that when the data set gets submitted for review, it goes to the um, review dashboard. We get to make notes, do some automated stuff, like keep a checklist of what was wrong, and then send the feedback back, or if everything is in order, we can publish it. That's what the review dashboard does for us, and a bit of a, I think, for the reviewers, the most useful feature is that we have a, um, a checklist that basically allows you to auto-generate the feedback. So if something is wrong in the review phase, you can just check it, and it generates paragraphs that we've set up beforehand and we can also relatively easily change to create feedback to send. So if you want to know more about either of these dashboards, please find my colleagues at number one and number two of the demos. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So now we have the third demo, Easy Review, a graphical user interface for Dataverse dataset reviews. Please, Jan. So, thank you. Hi everyone, I think it's a really a coincidence that um, this um, order has been chosen. So what I want to present and demo to you today is Easy Review, which is a tool that um, facilitates um, the, the review process and makes it a bit more easy instead of then using mails on that end. Yeah, because currently what we're doing, I mean, um, we, are, uh, we are doing this via email. We're just going through the data set and just remember what kind of critique we have. And that's kind of a problem. And I wanted to solve that using a software solution. And this software solution at the end should streamline this review process. Should, uh, where you should be able to distribute these reviews among experts, that this is a completely transparent um, um, process at the end, and that the user at the end can collect all of these reviews in a single run. Yeah? So this is solved by using Easy Review. This is um, the UI at the end. It's a web-based app that you can use as an external tool for your Dataverse installation, and just click under on your Dataverse installation on Review this data set and get it and share it with the user at the end. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So going next to the fourth demo, semantic enrichment pipelines with perfect using Dockerized services with Thomas. So you need to, to uh, identify the numbers uh, and, and to know which demo we, you will uh, assist. Hey, I'm Thomas. I'm with Dans. Uh, I'm here today to explain a small bit about well, semantic enrichment pipelines with Prefect using Dockerized services. For a project which we are doing with uh, Odyssey, uh, we are creating a uh, portal which hosts uh, enriched, enriched metadata, in which case we iteratively generate uh, new semantic links using a variety of sources. So. Some of the stuff which is listed here, for example, Cosmos or Garlic, is capable of performing queries or retrieving information from controlled uh, vocabularies, which we can then use to enrich various uh, data sources, for example, the list collection or some of the uh, micro data from CBS. Because of the technology stack we're using, so a number of Dockers as well as uh, da uh, Dataverse Docker in this sense, we can very quickly customize and create infrastructure to create, map, and expand upon these semantic collections. 
This puts us in a position of being able to iterate very quickly and create reusable infrastructure, uh, which we can apply, create in any order. Considering we're using Docker and uh, the pipelines create, well, new versions every time, it's also automatically versioned and uh, fair as a result. Um, in the demo, I plan to walk you through some of the uh, design choices we have made, some of the uh, solutions we've implemented as a result. Uh, it covers both Prefect as well as a bit of CI-CD, as well as some of the templating we have used to uh, create Docker uh, containers in a number of minutes, as well as uh, some considerations for getting things running pretty much literally out of the box. Thank you. And now the fifth demo, upstream container support becoming a reality. Yeah, hi again, uh, whatever, Phil. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, upstream containers becoming a reality. We're talking about containers. Uh, as you might have heard yesterday during the talk by Gustavo, or today by Gustavo, and yesterday by Stefano, and yesterday, uh, today by Stefano, uh, things are moving, and Dataverse is evolving. The SPA will be decoupled optional UI. You can basically leave it out or run your own. Um, and so that means that Dataverse becomes a uh, real backend service, and that means we need something else than, or might need something else, at least for development, than we do in a classic installation. So we put together a working group uh, under the GDCC to get the community roped in to create basically containers to be aligned, lookalike, opaque, reusable, distributable, automated. I'm not going to read that all to you. Um, so our demo will be about how you can build these images that we provide for in upstream and uh, how to set up a complete development inversion in like three to four minutes depending on the internet connection and a sneak peek on the future authentication broker with OIDC. Yeah, thank you. And now the sixth presentation, demo. Displaying rich metadata of social science data objects harvested from Dataverse repository on X Libris Primal Library Discovery Service. It's a large title. Please. <laughs> That's why you should come. Um, uh, there are a lot of uh, new initiatives uh, for metadata aggregation as YOSC, OpenAir. They have their own <laughs> metadata repositories. And these repositories uh, store objects with uh, very basic descriptions. So uh, the idea of the project that we implemented, and I will be presenting in a demo, is uh, uh, to show how we can uh, make uh, these uh, generic metadata descriptors uh, more extensive, to include more uh, metadata in them, and make them more fair, because in fair principles you need uh, to have detailed descriptions of the data, right? Um, so this is the implemented model you cannot see. You will be able to see it in more detail in the demo. Uh, so we use several uh, fields and the generic descriptors in order to make um, generic descriptors more rich. And this is the generalized model that um, uh, can be extended from our use case, and we will uh, show how it looks. In practice, we uh, implemented it using Dataverse as the source of metadata and uh, Ex Libris library service as um, a display place. Thank you. The seventh uh, demonstration, application domain-specific adaptation of Dataverse without forking. Please. Yeah, thank you. I'm Johannes. I'm from ZBMED in Germany, and we've created a new Dataverse application, or based on Dataverse, but our target community wanted many changes. And we wanted to implement all those changes and requests they had, but we didn't want to fork Dataverse because it's already great and they implement so many features we need but how can we do so? Um, and before we, I go to that part, I would like to introduce you to our main use case we have. 
we deal with medical data in our use case. And in Germany, we protect medical data quite strongly, so we cannot share the medical data into a centralized platform. But around the, the sensitive data, the data collections, which are really protected, which cannot be shared, many other data can be shared. And all the data can be aggregated centrally. So centrally, we have a lot of data, but a lot of data without data files. In the Dataverse lingo, we have data sets without data files. And as you all know, the user interface of Dataverse is focused on data files, but we don't have them. Hence, we could not really use the Dataverse user interface without not catering the needs of our community. So what we did is we created a new user interface in front of Dataverse, basically a React-based SPA, which was pitched yesterday and today. We did it already. However, we reinvented the wheel a bit. So we are really keen on seeing the new developments, the new React uh, JavaScript library, so we can change and build on that. But if you would like to see our current approach, our current application, and see how the React application works with React SBR, Keycloak integration with OIDC, and Dataverse backend, come to our booth. I'm happy to show you around. Now we are almost done. Uh, enhancing discoverability through passage of PIDs and metadata between research tools using Airspace Dataverse as an example. We, and we have Rory, please. Oops. Hi, everyone. Um, so for those who don't know, uh, as a bit of background, Airspace is a digital research platform comprising an electronic lab notebook, a sample management module, a large connected ecosystem of tools, and a set of APIs that enhance um, flows of data and metadata from the preparation and active research phase into uh, archiving and storage, which of course we have supported already with our existing integration with Dataverse. Um, and this is just uh, uh, gives you a little bit of insight into the existing integration, which is that you can select data sets from our space, prepare them, and then export them into Dataverse. So the focus of the talk today is on the second phase of the integration, which we're now starting on, which consists of uh, three areas of focus. One is PID operability, so interoperability of PIDs used in both Dataverse and, uh, and RSpace. Second, uh, expanded interoperability also of transfer of metadata between RSpace and Dataverse. And third, the addition of a data curation function to RSpace to enable a data curator to um, help prepare deposits for deposits in Dataverse and ultimately other repositories as well including things like reviewing and commenting on the proposed deposit, editing the deposit, approving the deposit, and making the deposit. And Philip Consett is going to join me and talk a little bit about how Dataverse is being used and how they would like it to be, sorry, how RSpace and Dataverse are being used at UIT and how this fits into some of the uh, plans I'll describe. Thank you. And to conclude the last demonstration, Onboarding Dataverse repositories in open air provides a gateway to EOSC. Pedro. Thank you. This is, in fact, a presentation with my colleague, um, um, okay, it's not updated, with my colleague, uh, André. So we, we, in Minho, together with another colleague from, uh, in, from Athens uh, in Athena Research Center, are the product managers of, of, of this service in, in open air. So basically, this is a, a, a service for repositories uh, managers to onboard the, the different uh, sources in, in, in open air, so to onboard the data repositories or the publication repositories or other kinds of uh, data sources. And it's in the open air provide that they can play with uh, the main uh, backend services uh, that we have uh, available. So this is mainly targeting content provider managers. Uh, what we have now, and it's uh, really in production, and Andre and Milica also already talked a bit in the first day, in the, in the yesterday in the in the workshop. So uh, that the open air provide is already um, integrated with the onboarding process of the European Open Science Cloud. So when someone is part of the open air infrastructure, can benefit from the open air provide services. It can also facilitate the process of onboarding uh, into the uh, research product catalog in the in the European Open Science Cloud. 
So in fact, uh, the Dataverse um, software uh, by default since the version 4, uh, the release 14, is uh, we have the compatibility with the open air guidelines for data archives. Uh, so with the process is it's, it's easy for, for, for us to, to, to comply and to get uh, um, part of this uh, relevant uh, international infrastructure. So we will be available to, to clarify a bit. So the demo is also um, uh, an opportunity also to get some feedback, to improve a bit because the service, the added value services are quite mature and good for the publications repositories, not so for data repositories. And this is a good opportunity also to expand a bit this part with your feedback. Thank you. Thank you all for this presentation uh, and to to comply with the, the time you have. Just to remind, now we um, should go to outside, select the demo we would like to attend, and after this session, uh, we will have the coffee break and then uh, a new panel, okay? So uh, after the demonstrations, we will have time to, for a, a short break and then we came back to, the, to, the, to this room and attend to, to the panel of national and regional initiatives. Okay.
Okay. Let's start. Thank you for joining again. So we are almost done for this day. Um, so we will have now a, a panel um, dedicated to national or regional or local initiatives. The idea is bit to to have uh, three, four experiences uh, to for us to to discuss the way that. Uh, at the national level, or in some ca cases at a, a regional level, we are uh, um, working together to, to empower the community. Uh, technically speaking, the developments, the installation, the, the, the implementation, but also in terms of uh, um, developing um, uh, community efforts, uh, developing support, uh, training, these this different flavors, these different uh, um, dimensions of um, uh, networking of sustainability of, of the of dataverse um, communities. So f for that, of course, there are other experiences relevant uh, here in this. Uh, apart from these four, uh, and then you can also uh, join us in the in the debate. We will have like short presentations, five minutes, from uh, Vitoria Lubic from the Scholars Portal from Canada with the the, the view from Canada. Then. Um, Dimitri, Dimitri. So the no, the name is is wrong. Is Dimitri Tsabu from uh, the research data gov from uh, from France. Uh, René um, Faustino Gabriel Jr. Uh, from uh, Brazil, representing a consortium of of dataverse from different uh, organizations. And then uh, Juan Corrales, Corrales uh, from the consortium Madronio. So th that is a, a consortium of six uh, six uh, universities from uh, uh, Madrid. Madrid city or Madrid region? Okay. Madrid region, yes. So let's hear first the, the five minute presentation. So just, and then we can have a discussion with some questions. Also from the audience, be ready if you want also to share or to have any uh, added value information in terms of your national initiative because there are other uh, national or re regional initiatives also represented here. So we can start. Control L, faz control L. Control L. Ok. You can start. Yes, yeah, so, so my name is Victoria and I'm, I'm developer, so my, 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 my view is more into the technical side. So I apologize if... Uh, so I'm representing the Borealis, which is the... Uh, which is the... We are getting... We are the national service for, for, for Canadian uh, Dataverse. And uh, so as you see, we have like already 60 institutions across Canada and we are a bilingual platform on French and English. But 60, it's what... Now in Dataverse, but I just got news that we actually got another 10 institutions. So we are now sus subscribers that we have to. So we are now 70 institutions because we switched from universities to actually also colleges and other institutions. So this is, uh, and uh, so the projects that I just will let you know about this, some projects that we have to do. It's, uh, we had the, a lot of uh, data in the uh, Nestor some of the collections that we call ADC uh, on the Nestor system. And as you know, uh, Nestor dropped the support and we wanted to switch it to our uh, Dataverse installation. And we are in final stages of uh, finishing it. And uh, the curation happens by, like the different um, institutions are responsible for different collections inside this ODC collection. And uh, to implement this Nestor transition, we also needed to create uh, uh, data curation tool and we have second version of the explorer we have a policy for the integration and preservation and the last thing is the globus uh, integration what you probably already heard from Jim about it and this is the, our uh, new architecture for the for the uh, for the switching to from Nestor to, to Borealis uh, I, I will not get into it because you don't have time <laughs> And this is the, the immigration process, like how we have to, to deal with it. If anyone interested, I can continue after that. And the problems that we, we had is the inconsistencies between the DDI and Dataverse DDI. Uh, various 
The biggest thing, how do we have thousands of data sets. So, and if you have many institutions that want to go to us and for, they had their own dataverses, and now you want to have one centralized dataverse instance, how do you tra transit with thousands of data sets inside the dataverse? We had a big problem with it because of, uh, because of the ingest process that takes too long and it's not parallelized. So we paralyzed everything else, but the ingest itself takes forever. And, uh, but we, we kind of managed to deal it for some good time. And uh, so lacking the features that uh, Nestor had, such as like different FIFO formats and the other stuff, uh, editing variable metadata and harvesters because the search was not satisfactory in Dataverse, so we had to create our own. So this is data curation tool. I don't really go inside. <laughs> So the idea is uh, to, because Dataverse doesn't have, doesn't have a variable level metadata editor, it's only the data set level metadata. So the data curation tool, we needed to edit and write back to Dataverse. So it's what the data curation does. So this is the tool. And this is like, you, you put all these different data, you can have uh, like weights and groups and all this other stuff. And the Data Explorer is like data curation, it's just for reviewers. And uh, so it looks like that, almost very similar. And you can analyze data using the cross tabulation tables. I'm going very fast <laughs> because if you have any questions, then you can like ask it. Uh, and of course, data integrity. We have Ar Archematica connected to our system, uh, but some, not many institutions actually want to use it. So we, we want to say just only a very simple thing. So we want to just replace the files, like we, we, we run the data set checksum integrity test every month, and whatever is broken, we want to replace it, but without changing the version, and it's, we, we did it automatically, so it automatically replaced the backup copies. The problem with it is that it cannot do it for, uh, it doesn't work, it's a mistake here, for ingested files, because you cannot uningest corrupted files, and this is what uh, we had problem, and probably have to work more about it. And the global integration you already heard from Jim, final stages. <laughs> we have the app and uh, it worked as external tool, but Jim did it as a, uh, would extend it for the different storages and as a part of a native, uh, uh, not from external tool. And we have the front end in our GitHub and we have a video. And we have the problems that hopefully will be solved, some of them, it's very restricted files. You don't want to move big files from one place to another. And uh, uh, yes, so you can see what all the problems with the mostly restricted files and uh, with the new solution that Jim provides, we can put it in directories and in this way to, to resolve, uh, resolve uh, restricted files issues. And that's it, so try to be short. <laughs> So hello again, everyone. So as mentioned, I'm Dimitri Zabo from INRA. I'm presenting the French National Initiative uh, Recherche Data Group. So as mentioned in the title, it's an ecosystem. I'll go on that notion a bit later. And to give you a bit of history, uh, we had an existing uh, repository installation before uh, at my institute called Data INRA. Uh, some of you may know, but as I mentioned, it's not only a repository. Um, after that, there was a study and prefiguration phase that was um, commanded by the ministry, and we didn't do it as in right, it was a national thing. And some of the key take-home messages were to avoid fragmentation, to focus on quality both for deposit and support, which was the third and maybe foremost uh, item. Uh, it has been established with a collective government and two, uh, team. And um, Recherche Data Group was um, part of the French uh, Open Science National Plan, uh, second edition, because we had the first one before. And as you can see, I'll go really fast after that, uh, it's even written with the, the name, so a strong support on that, uh, with objectives, of course, to uh, train uh, and support and um, improve RDM all over the data lifecycle system and provide solutions uh, for data repository 
and data registry, uh, which I'll go more shortly on this. And uh, also an important thing to note, it's complementary to the thematic repositories, even if it's in a national solution, it does not aim at uh, encompassing the whole um, panorama of uh, repositories. And as I mentioned, uh, there are a registry component, uh, which is not currently open, a repository uh, instance which is centralized, it's not uh, federated for all French institutions, so even if it's uh, complementary to thematics um, repositories, it's open for everyone uh, for data depositing and exploration. And on the upper side, you have the support module. So with data management clusters uh, that are geographically close to researchers, meaning that, for example, there is one in said city or said region, so that uh, it provides a network uh, of cooperation with the local universities of organizations and to address those specific issues that they may encounter. Of course, um, such local uh, implementation is generic. So to complement that, there's also uh, on the right, uh, top of the right, thematic reference centers which pro, who provide uh, domain expertise on specific uh, scientific domains and research centers which provide resources and the trainings for the other uh, centers or clusters. So I won't go into the details of every one of each because uh, of the time, but I might go back on the questions. So, uh, I started with the beginning to give a few uh, next steps. Um, as I mentioned, the repository is already opened uh, since last year, but we are moving to a new infrastructure uh, by the end of the year and next year. Uh, in the next year, we'll also open the data registry module. And by 2025, uh, when it the next call for that in France, uh, we aim to become a national uh, research infrastructure to have a determined structure, uh, which I mentioned later is also a, a factor of sustainability. We also aim to attain core trustee certification, but we have to be an entity for that, so that's why I didn't put the year uh, exactly. Uh, to work then after the infrastructure on the ease of deployment, because we have the current infrastructure, it's not the, that easy for the upgrade, etc. And the more important point, uh, contribute more to Dataverse, which is also, I think, a um, factor of sustainability if you want uh, a tool to subsist, to uh, give back and make sure it's still living. And uh, because we haven't been uh, giving back that much uh, since, even if we are GDCC member and we do uh, some more contributions. So, that was a bit short, sorry uh, for a uh, dense ecosystem, but we might go on uh, back on this, uh, on the question. But as for what I think, because we can't stay with sustainable, because we are not sustained for long now, even if uh, for the institutional part we exist since uh, 2018, and a bit more for the other services to data. Uh, one important part, especially as a national initiative, is the official uh, support and recognition. As mentioned, uh, we are part of the Open Science Plan, which means uh, it's written not in the law, but in the strategic initiatives from the, the ministry, so not likely to be uh, changed in the, the next day. Apart from this, it might seem like the previous point, but we also have uh, direct involvement and support from the ministry into making it more sustainable and plain, and we'll have legitimacy as a national infrastructure. It might seem very top-down, but even for adoption, uh, endorsement is uh, two ways early and it's always reassuring even for the end users really in their research to see that there are nice lights in the alley and people coming the other way too. So it's uh, also very important for adoption. And the other part is really the grassroots level uh, to make uh, RDM and the use of the platform uh, part of the culture of the French uh, 
science, we would say, to be uh, the most broad possible. Uh, first thing is, of course, we are not doing uh, all these dataverse installations, all these data stewardship for nothing. Is that there's a need, but is there really a need? So the most important thing is to really set the cultural uh, change so that users realize the importance, the cost of not having fair data, etc. It's very common for us in the room, but still has to go through a lot of training and education to, for it to be um, really diffused and share the success stories too. And another important um, aspect which comes from the project is the holistic approach. I'm not meaning holistic in some uh, religious or something way. I know in English it can be uh, tendentious, but more of having the ecosystem as a whole. Uh, we're not developing a platform separately from the existing um, support structure that existed. It's all connected. But with the will to adapt to specificities, like we've mentioned, the both uh, local um, level and uh, speci domain specific level, so that it's not uh, broad but without being fine grained. And finally, it's uh, I put some from network to community, it's a bit uh, obvious because we're a database community. But the idea is that uh, it's not just about setting a network and say, okay, you, 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 you're going to do that, but actually setting up uh, exchanges between the people and it has been a really good um, outcome of the project to see that people from the various institutes, um, their RDM teams coming together or even creating via the help they could get from the others uh, in their local area. So last word on the sustainability topic. One is that you can throw me stones after my presentation. The business uh, model aspect is still work in progress. Of course, we're not going to disappear uh, next morning and not receive funding, as I mentioned, because there's a support from the ministry. But the more independent and lasting aspect is still in, uh, in work in progress. But the good aspect of that is that it's a co-construction with consultation of the other organization and not something that the ministry is saying, okay, it's gonna be funded like that and you don't pay, you don't go to the repository. And uh, last uh, kind of troll or joke uh, thing is, is sustainability that important? Uh, of course it is, we have a panel for that. But what I mean is that um, we have to consider that the real important aspect is the cultural change so that open science becomes science and it has been done, uh, said uh, by better people than me, but it's that that's important and not the sustainability of the platform only to consider. So thank you. I think it'll be a bit longer. Hello, my name is René. Um, forgive my English, sorry, Dan. Um, um, I represent the Brazilian Consortium of Open Science and Research Data. Okay. Uh, on to uh, 2017, um, there, there were some education actions for the implementation of research data repositories. It was from the uh, years of words that an agreement between RNP, IBICT, CNPq, uh, uh, open a public uh, not, not, not just seeking a research to study research data in Brazil. Um, in this, this research, a survey was sent to appro approximately um, um, 17,000 in investigators. Respons responses were obtained 
uh, showing that uh, 20 per, uh, percent uh, have already deposited that in repository outside Brazil. Okay. Um, still, in 2072s, for sharing data where study dataverse was chosen uh, as the system data. Okay, in, in 2018, um, uh, was studied um, open access to recited data in Brazil. Uh, he uh, was created any reports. Okay. So this shows some. Okay. Uh, in four years, né, research and technical reports were produ produced in Brazil of the lesson learning. Planning of implementation data repository e technolo uh, technological solution for data sharing. In 2009, the proof of concept uh, begin with the uh, installation, installation of Dataverse uh, in Ubuntu, CentOS, and Debian. Write um, installation manual in Portuguese. Tá? Study the use of persistent indicators with DOI and handle. Uh, também study send the uh, large files. Tá? It study uh, use the license to sharing data. Uh, in 2019, uh, um, the, the project will, um, have, um, sorry. In, in, uh, have an um, open government partnership, the RGP, uh, has incentive to the, the project to sharing data in Brazil. Um, uh, this institu institu institution uh, working in this this project, né? in 2020, uh, the Phil Cruz uh, launched a, a course of modular training in open science in Brazil, uh, uh, disseminando. Né? Uh, in, uh, in 2020, uh, a RNP, se uh, assign de GDCC tornando-se um member chip. Então, uh, 2020, uh, uh, um moment. Uh, we, we studied the preserva preservation digital on demand. Uh, Cartrasil, uh, Chibolet, uh, in Brazil, um, we use the Red Café, que é um, um federation authentication. Uh, we studied two dataverse uh, APIs e uh, repository policy development e um, to translate the dataverse to português brasileiro do Brasil, né? <laughs> yeah. um, 
in 2021 um, has created the Consórcio Consciência in Brazil, que uh, CNPq uh, assigned with data site um, promove, um, promoting the access DOI uh, for our institution in Brazil. And uh, uh, um, in this model, o, o CNPq uh, is o, um, o leader uh, data site in Brazil. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, Então, uh, also has selected four institutions for incubation the institu institutional repository of research data in 21 uh, on the Universidade Federal do Ceará UFG UFRA and CBPF uh, was the distribution uh, uh, were on the the learning uh, the the consortium uh, serves training in technological transfer to institutions okay. for a year weekendly meeting were held with techno and conceptual training and exchange of experience among participants Então, tá. Demands and needs were met for depositing data and creating document, documents uh, to scale the model. Okay. The roast research data repositories, the document repositories network, which are right exists um, with uh, um, Tá. Uh, e change de, de, de name, né? Aqui. Uh, então, change de name de red, rede de repositórios to uh, rede de repositórios digital, em Brasil. Tá. This is model of governance, tá? Uh, on, uh, on this... Se... Uh, a... Uh, uh, the Scalate Network, uh, the network governance is um, in, in two uh, ways. Uh, in model uh, top-down, where the look at the na national policies né? and the, uh, the bottom-up uh, with demands of repositories and institutions. So, exist these two visions. Tá? The, the visibility repository is integrated with Oasis BR, uh, Open Air, and La Referencia. So, our repositories uh, was integrated with was BR, referência e Open Air. Tá? Um, corretamente, in network, uh, we have five repositories in production and 11 uh, in pilot. Ok? Tá? It's all. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hi, um, this presentation is about the uh, initiatives that uh, we have in the Consortium Madroño in Spain to build a sustainable network 
uh, and community uh, of practice. Uh, the Madronio Consortium is formed by six universities, one national university, and five uh, of the region of Madrid. And we have several um, uh, knowledge open science uh, service. One of them is the repository, uh, the database repository, Esciencia Datos. Esciencia, some character, characteristics of Esciencia Datos is that we have the core tacit certification and we have some particular characteristics that are not in other, in other database installation. For example, we don't have SL archive. Uh, they, uh, they are the librarians who talk with the, with the research, researchers. Um, who, uh, they, we need a, a readme, readme form that is, sell, is, is sent from the researcher to the librarian and are the librarian who creates the data set. Uh, we have a database uh, collection per university um, we admit uh, any document type up to uh, 100 uh, gigabytes per, de per data set and we have a local installation all the computer the machine that we need to to be a secure service. Uh, the collaboration is in the DNA of the Consortium Madroño because we are... Uh, ah, sorry. Uh, the, and the collaboration is in the DNA of the Consortium Madroño because we are a, a, a small team. We are only two uh, IT staff, but we have a complete open science working group uh, that is formed by, uh, for uh, one research that's in uh, open science evangelist too. We have uh, uh, staff uh, from the board of the Consortium Madroño, from the universities, and we have several uh, librarians from all the universities. The, this working group uh, has worked last year in the DMP tool and um, mostly in the Ciencia de Datos, that is the data repository, but also in, in training and other, um, other uh, subjects related to open science, other issues. Uh, now we are defining, defining our training plan for the next three, four years. Um, we have, uh, the, we have uh, create training for external institu institutions related to data management. And we have received uh, many help from the data database community, community uh, especially in the started moment of the Esencia Datos. To create a, 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 sustainable, a sustainable community, it's important to have a sustainable repository. Uh, we have now the core trust, the core trust seal, and the core trust seal uh, has been a really has been really helpful to to find some drawback in the in our repos repository. After that, we have created, a, in, with the core trust seal, we have created a preservation plan. We have now a remote backup in other institution in the SESUC that had the other database, that database instance in Spain. And uh, as, we, as I have I said before, we are training, uh, we're working in the training plan for the future. The support that we offer to librarian and to research from the IT part of the Consorcio Madroño is to have the essential datos up to date with the with database with the three, four, all the uh, new, new, newest version. Installs some third party software when, when we need to do it, uh, personalize the aspect of the essential datos. We create some small develop, uh, development for mainly for the AI to be uh, compli compliant with the exigence of the 
National Harvester, Spanish National Harvester. Um, we offer uh, also some, some help to upload huge files because uh, the, our, uh, our system don't, don't allow to, to upload uh, files over 20, 30 gigabytes, so the, and we had to do it in a, a manual form, a manual way. And there, there are some cases where uh, there are files that could be done completely public because they need uh, the approbation of some health institution. Uh, some, um, sometimes it's an American institution, other an Spanish uh, institution. In this case, we uh, have uh, decided to encrypt the, the file and send the, the password to the person that has the, the permission to access to the file. And to build a community of users, uh, we work at uh, a uh, uh, university level. They are the librarians who work with the research in, in at first. Sometimes uh, the IT part of the consortium Madroño has to uh, has to uh, meet with the research, but it's not the common the common way of of, of work. Then other characteristics of the science of data uh, uh, don't to attract to other research that we ha uh, we have a big project with many data sets. We had three uh, nine nine hundred data set in now and. Almost 600 uh, come from this grid project, this big project. One of them is related to the Spain-Portugal border about the, the, cult, the cultural, uh, the cultural issues in the in the little village in the in the front, in the border. Um, la, la, the libraries of the universities collaborate with the research department of the universities. Um, uh, the more important things to, to build a community of users for us is that the libraries offer full support to the research, researchers. So the researchers. Uh, here is an example of collaboration in, uh, between the, the uh, one library the Universidad Carlos, of the University of Carlos III uh, and this investigation group is a project uh, called uh, FOSS for full open science and this is a fin and, uh, project that is finished now uh, and all the all the in investigation group had uh, all these research uh, outputs on open on, uh, on open access the, the data set uh, thesis Publication, all the all the results are in open access. And to uh, for talk about some challenges and goals, uh, the more important is uh, to be useful for the researchers and for the librarian, mostly for the research. If for these objectives, we have to offer an attractive tools. We are working in get better, better, better statistics. Um, it's very important to uh, to obtain visibility for our that data set because we are a small project. Um, it's important uh, to be found in, in Harvard, in open air, in data set, in other in other in other harvesters, in other project uh, bigger than than science And it's all. Thank you. So many thanks uh, for also for the effort to make the effort to present different perspectives of, of the national initiative, some, some more focus on technical developments, other on, on, the, on the policy or, on the, um, or in the infrastructure. So now wh what I, I would like to have is the, your contributions. I can ask questions, but uh, so your contributions also to share, uh, to share experiences. W what will be interesting to her is about um, uh, the challenges for, to, for the establishment of national or, or regional initiatives in terms of um, 
uh, infrastructures. Uh, in terms of uh, policies, we heard about the experience from France, for example, that the, so the, 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 it's quite policy oriented, let's say, the, the service because of the open science policy that they have in France. And then the other uh, um, area that I would like also to hear about your experiences is about um, the a more community driven thing where we do the support and develop uh, uh, competences in, in in the different uh, members of the different of the different uh, um, national initiatives uh, i would like also to hear about uh, how boreal is apart from the technical thing also expand and uh, improve the network at the national level as i think boreal is a great use case for us to learn there are other colleagues from Canada, if you want also to join and to say something, uh, it will be great. Uh, and also there are experiences from Catalonia also, as, uh, as, as they have uh, in Madrid. There are experiences in the Netherlands. We are starting something in also in Portugal. There are other, other cases, so feel free to, to jump in and to try to say something about these three areas, so the infrastructure, the policy, and the community development in terms of competencies. So feel free, we have a microphone. You can just do comment, you can ask questions, you can just share your um, your uh, uh, lessons learned, your challenges for in terms of sustainability of these networks. You wanted to say something from Canada, no? <laughs> Um, so my name is Dylan Dearborn. I'm uh, the Research Data Management Coordinator at the University of Toronto. Um, we work very closely with Borealis. Um, we've gone through a bunch of transitions this year. So Borealis has moved to be a national um, service outside of Ontario, which it was previously Scholars Portal um, Dataverse. So now we're national. Um, U of T is a service provider for this service, and Borealis is reporting through U of T so that it's at a national level. Um, we're now at 70 institutions. We're expanding from universities to colleges, as Victoria mentioned. We're also investigating ways to add individual research organizations, such as research hospitals, to our network, which brings along a host of other issues that we need to investigate, like sensitive data and supporting those types of workflows. So if anyone is working with that or has experience with those, we'd love to hear from you and learn from you. Um, but as our community goes, I think um, Lena is going to speak tomorrow to some of the ways that we bring together member institutions to talk about new developments, um, priority areas for development, get feedback from the communities, and ensure that our institutional administrators are all on the same page with um, how the system works and what is capable um, within our developments. I don't know if you had any specific Great. questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other input from the, yes, Jim? Yeah, I, I was just curious, ha having worked with the Texas Digital Library, which is a consortium at the level of, right, the institutions in, in the universities in Texas are all working with them. We, we've done things for them over time to kind of make it easier for them to manage that consortium from, you know, thinking about uh, being able to put different stores that might be storing the data in different places in sub-collections so that each university that has a collection can store its data somewhere else, um, things like being able to have the, the permissions on a collection so that they'll set up a, managers from University X will automatically inherit permissions on things created inside the university. We've talked about, um, inside that collection, we've talked about things like uh, PID providers that each university may have its own and so they want their collection to use their, their PID account, right, their DOI account and so on. I'm just curious if those are coming out in the national infrastructures or if because you're national, are you are you able to, you know, pull things together more, or do you really have those kind of needs in the software as well? You know, what what's the policy at the national level for these things? Uh, so regarding the storage of uh, like having separate storages, uh, what happens is we 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 move to the OLRC uh, two which is the Canadian, we have a system administrator who knows much more than me about it. Uh, but, but has like, it's a Canadian, uh, we're actually hosting it all, but uh, we have several of them, like I think three of them 
across, uh, across Canada that are having copies of each file, so such that we will preserve the data integrity of the files, but, but we don't have a separate storages for separate institutions. So what we did, and we had a lot of problems with it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's putting the, importing the, the data sets to, to our collection, because not, not everyone starts from scratch. Some people already have data sets on different platforms, and we want to bring it all uh, to Dataverse. And if it's like a lot of data, then it, it becomes problematic. And uh, the other question was about, uh, the last one was about, oh, PIDs, yes, exactly. So we had a, we had a, we had a transformation, we have a migration from University of Alberta in, in, inside our Dataverse, and we already had the DOIs, in, uh, DOIs. so what we did is we actually did migrate, so what, what happened is, like, it's all run by Scholars Portal, but uh, what happened, we just released these PIDs from the data, set, data side and brought them into the, into the uh, uh, Borealis, and then just republished them again with the same DOIs. So we preserved their own DOIs uh, like it was before. But generally we run, uh, like, whole thing, but like maybe some, someone else knows more about it. Yes, on the topic of storage, we have a kind of a similar thing. We have uh, specific buckets for any institutional collection even though we don't have um, a use case where it's a different storage. We just had different buckets. We thought everyone would ask to have their own storage, but for now we don't have uh, this case, but it has been running only for one year in production, so maybe that's why too. Uh, on the topic of sub-collection management, we actually ask the institution to um, dedicate some time, of course, we do provide resources through the center and the central team, but the whole idea is to build capacity and not to have a central team managing everything and getting overcrowded and therefore losing on quality and also becoming a strain from the researchers, which can be taken care of by local RDM teams. The collections, I just forgot to answer the questions with Jim about the, we, we use the same thing like Texas does, exactly the same, we give roles for different universities, we have the administrator, and the, the people who, like universities are, we're running their own collections, so we're responsible for their own curation of collections, and, uh, and inheriting of the, of, the, of the properties. And we also have like IP groups, and things like that. Hi, thanks. Um, so with the national collaborations, can you talk a little bit more about different levels of institutional support? So how are, how is each institution contributing to the national initiatives and is it all very equal? Does it go very smoothly? I think when there's institutional collaboration, sometimes they're, you know, a little hard to navigate. So can you talk about any challenges with that and how you've dealt with some of them? Yeah, good question. <laughs> so is there any? In the case of Consortium Madroño, uh, the Consortium Madroño, the, work, the working group was creating before any data set, any, any, any database, database or other data repositories. So uh, we have created the policies before have any data set. So um, we had a, a working group from the 2005, so we, we were um, uh, really, accost accost uh, we had a collaboration, hist a very uh, old uh, collaboration history. We don't have problem to, to create the police or anything similar. We, um, and now, uh, in, uh, um, there are 
and national projects to create a new record, uh, that database. And in this database, the ocean um, will be recollect all the uh, harvest, harvest uh, the existing repositor repositories and create uh, co database collection for the from the new institutions. Okay, so on the um, part of the, the responsibility or what can institution do in the freedom of movement, let's say, actually when the institution join the ecosystem, they have to accept the general terms and conditions, of course, and to sign a document. But apart from that, they're pretty free to organize the, um, their collection as they, they would want. The um, common denominator or minimal expected level is um, the core trust seal requirements, so in terms of curation, uh, metadata, um, and generic good practices. Um, other than that, um, it's pretty free, and we are working on creating also a network of the administrators and curators, which is not something ministry driven or something. Of course, we do make the effort of organizing the reunions, uh, the meetings, sorry, uh, and etc. but just because we have uh, time dedicated for that, but uh, they really can come and address the topic they want, and we have the idea of involving them more and more in prioritizing every development. But uh, as I mentioned, it's a bit the same as the business model in terms of contribution or exactly what weight they can have in prioritizing uh, new features, etc. It's still a work in progress, but they're involved in the definition of it. Um, some just quick ideas about the contribution. Uh, we're really not sure about the financial contribution. It's really something that has to be thought over, but we'd like to have um, other contributions, for example, in developing time, or etc., or other data storage time additionally to the time they have to contribute for their own uh, space that they already do. Regarding contributions, uh, we have a financial contribution of institutions, so we have a subscription fee. Uh, maybe not that much, <laughs> but uh, so we kind of pr provide a little bit for our service. And everything else, actually, we are doing. So we are kind of responsible for them, except the uh, curators. Every, every, every university has their own curator, curators who cura curate their own and responsible for curation of, of their own collections. Hene, post complement? Yes. Ah, excuse me, Katie. Um, I would like to complement uh, Renee's uh, talk. Talking about uh, our situation in Brazil, we have uh, um, periodical meetings that we share our experiences. Uh, the four institutions that was beginning the, the network, the data uh, repository data, data repository network. And so um, we have um, DOI um, for, from the, gover the governor, federal governor, but we decide our own repository policies and how it's gonna be. But uh, in this meeting, we discuss a lot about, well, <coughs> sorry, about the best practices. And it's very interesting because we are from um, all the, the, the country. We, we have one institution from the north and the south and the middle, and so the Amazon. And so they are uh, different contexts. And so it's very interesting because we learned a lot each other and uh, it's been a very good experience. Okay. Great, thank you, thank you. It was an important. I would, I, I would ask uh, uh, René or, or, or you, or if you can say it in Portuguese if you want. What, how can you manage all those relevant institutions, national institutions that in the past they were not so uh, keen to collaborate and now they are collaborating in this big project. So what was the most, the lesson learned from this project? What was the, the trigger to, to, to start this collaboration from this relevant CNPK, uh, 
caps, they were not collaborating in the past so much as they now they are doing. It's because of the open science trend. What is the the main reason? Yes, yes, it's because of that and because of the 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 OJP um, oh, the that was in the past uh, 2019, and there was a commitment to to implement open science in a national level. So these are one of the, 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 the initiatives that was uh, 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 planned to implement. And so they are together to, to do that. Thank you, thank you. Okay, we are coming to an end. Uh, so th there are any other um, uh, initiatives that you want to, to share also? Feel free to, to jump in. There are other countries here represented. But we have one more comment. Yes, from Portugal. Yes. <coughs> Hello, uh, so my name is João Cardoso, I'm from the Portuguese Funding Agency and I just want to make, uh, not, not so much a, a request, but uh, an incentive. We, over the course of these days, we've seen many good examples of Dataverse installations and Dataverse communities, especially in this panel today. We also do have a lot of universities and institutions that want or are in the process of creating their own installations. We, as a national funding agency, can support that initiative. Actually, we, we encourage it because we, we try we, and we do have our own installation, which, again, should be seen as a last resort. But we encourage actively that other, ins other institutions in the country create their own. So there is knowledge to be shared. There is uh, resources to be shared. So please contact us or, at the very least, try to contact other Dataverse installations within the country so that we could all collaborate and maybe next year we can also be featured in this panel uh, as a, a great use case for uh, the future. Well, thank you. Thank you, Joel. One, one thing that we have in, in Portugal, and I think it's a good example, um, it's not uh, so entirely from the Dataverse thing, let's say, but we have a, an RDM forum uh, informal community that in fact is quite uh, uh, instrumental for the knowledge and the competencies that we are creating in different uh, people in different groups. So the RDM forum started to be only a, a, an annual event. Now in fact we have an annual event and three working groups, one about uh, training, another one about repositories and another one about policies. And the results of these working groups are great. But most important than the results are the process. So the fact that every month, at least once a month, people join uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a meeting, they share experiences, they create documents from the repositories working group. For example, Rita is there. Rita from Universidad, uh, University of Aveiro also contribute a lot. So we create uh, um, guidance together, <laughs> uh, curation guides based on some things that we learn also from Canada and from other things. So. Also, this kind of um, um, parallel community is not only driven by the Dataverse, but driven by good um, practices in terms of sharing data. They are quite uh, relevant. So there is an informal network that people that uh, are a bit alone in their institutions, but they are only one, one or two or three uh, uh, curators or data stewards or partially data stewards that they want to know others to, to share experiences. So this is, uh, I think, is a, a good experience that we have in, in Portugal around this RDM forum. Okay. Do you want to say something to finish? Yes. I just, want <laughs> <laughs> I, I just wanted to say that uh, regarding, we, we also have like a scholars portal day, like once per year, but uh, all the universe, like people come and we just represent everything new features of uh, Dataverse and other, because we also have other services as well, not only Dataverse uh, present, and we'll have, have uh, webinars and uh, we have a special uh, people who actually uh, do the uh, kind of social networking for the, for, for the community, yeah. Okay, any final comment from you? Thank you. I think uh, so. We we did. Uh, there are for sure other initiatives. We have different countries: German, Belgium, uh, represented here. If you want to say something, feel free. But so I think it, it it was good to 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 understand. So the the processes of development of some institutions. We we saw the developments in Brazil. We saw this 
uh, initiative from, from France and the, the well-experienced network in, in, in Canada, uh, uh, an institutional uh, consortium for a specific uh, uh, local uh, initiative, so I think it, it was good. We, let's continue. So because the, um, we put this panel in the program, sustainability is quite direct attached to the networks that we can create at the national and regional level, so I think we, we need to rely on this. With this, we thank you very much for your contribution, for your, your effort. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Soccer game in Pilates session. <laughs> Bring comfortable and appropriate clothing for the moment. So there is these instructions. We will have the before photo, yes, yes, before we go to the sports center, we will have a photo outside, really in front of the main entrance. We will take a photo there. I hope Mariana is here, and the, or at least, the, okay, you are, okay. Um, let's go together. We are s missing some people that are not here, that they will not appear in the photo, so. Follow Paula Moura, Paula Moura, follow the leader. We follow Paula Moura, and we will take the picture outside, okay. And then we go to the sports and we need to follow people from Minho, okay? Okay, let's go.